Hello and welcome to Fit to Box channel. Please like and subscribe and don't forget to jab that notifications bell for all my latest uploads. Today I'm in Sutton Coalfield at Mad Dog's Boxing Shop. Wayne Elcock, a former pro boxer, former British champion, former WBU world champion and former world title challenger um, against Arthur Abraham. Um, he's here with me and we're going to do an interview today and I just want to say thanks very much for Wayne's time. No, uh, absolutely superb. Um, I came last week and sort of checked the shop out and uh, I've done a recent review on the Clayton Reyes gloves, the uh, two different custom colours that you can get through Wayne's store. He obviously is a stockist for not only Reyes but lots of other different brands and part of his Reyes contract he can actually supply Reyes gloves in two different colours. Whatever colours that Reyes do he can do a combination of the two. So let's start off let's talk about Wayne and uh, how did you get into boxing? Literally just uh, always getting in trouble for fighting and school and so forth. Always liked to scrap and one of the kids there it was a, a boxer who was a part of an amateur boxing club sort of said you might be tough on the playground El Cop will come down the gym and we'll, we'll show you what it's all about literally and a uh, little bit older than me the kid was and so I went down the gym and, and, and it wouldn't happen these days to be fair or it mm. might in some gyms but basically the trainer let him get in the ring and do a bit of sparring I'd never really actually boxed I just thought I was a fighter yeah. uh, and I remember getting absolutely hammered <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> this game's tough you know I couldn't mm. land the shots on him yeah. and uh, I remember going home and I was, I'm, I'm always been a, I've always been a winner I've always been a very proud person and I just remember walking home from the gym that night uh, Licking me wounds and, and literally uh, just, oh, I'll, get that, I'll get him back, I'll get him back. And it, I think you either work one way or the other. I took a bit of a beating and I literally, it, I worked the other way for me. It just made me want it to be better. So yeah. I then started getting more and more into the fighting and, and became like literally a bit of a, a boxing historian, really, watching all the old timers, you know, uh, uh, seeing what they do and then trying to bring their magic into the gym with me and practicing different things. And as I say, you know, uh, I rapidly made progress. Mm. I obviously had a natural talent for it. Yeah, and yeah. just started picking things up and. Yeah. I remember that first season in boxing. Mm. I think I was only eight months into the into the sport, uh, unbeaten, uh, and in the ABA semi-finals of the junior ABAs alongside uh, Nazim Ami, David Starr in the likes of it. Yeah, yeah. Literally, I'd announced myself on the boxing scene kind of thing yeah. pretty early. So you got the boxing bug from that first night? <laughs> yeah, from that first night, yeah. That's Even though I took an average. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that sometimes happens, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, sometimes. yeah. It's, I think that, bit, that, that shows the character of the fight. I mean, you yeah. can see a kid in the gym, you know yourself, obviously mm. running your own club. You know, sometimes you see that talent in a kid, but then all of a sudden they get it on the nose and think, you know, this probably isn't for me. Yeah, but yeah. they've got all the tricks and the tools on the bags and they, they look natural and you can see they've got the ability. Mm. But I think that initial uh, being able to hold the shot, so to speak, I think it says a lot about most fighters and, and how they're going to progress in the yeah, sport. Yeah, yeah. How many kids would sort of that first night never have come back? A lot. Yeah, exactly. A lot. Yeah. yeah. So as you went into sort of the amateurs, um, what was your, tell me about your first boxing equipment. You know what, I'll be honest with you, uh, our, our parents didn't really have a lot of money, so you know I came from quite a poor background, and, and, and I remember going to the gym and obviously no boxing gloves, so I used to use there, uh, I remember the old Brian mitts, mm. no no mm. padding in them, you yeah, know, yeah, literally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I won't sell, mitts, sell mitts in store, believe it or not, right. uh, because I believe that contributed to me damaging my hands. I think right, if you're okay. quite a big puncher, mm. they didn't really offer the protection that I needed. Yeah. I kind of remember early days, uh, just, I mean, men, men's are, 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 are developed a fantastic jab because mm -hmm. my right hand I could hardly use this right. is all I can remember my first memories of the early parts of my career yeah, was yeah. literally oh, that's really my, my right hand less you know yeah. saying to my coach and like yeah, just work on your jab wine and, yeah. uh, did uh, you know. use uh, wraps with the mitts or was it one of them that you just put the mitts on in you know what I probably just put the mitts on without even mm -hmm. the protection of the hand wraps either mm -hmm. you know if I'm being honest yeah. uh, going back then there wasn't really the emphasis on sort of like you know come on make sure you got your wraps on no yeah, one really yeah. give the health and safety elements of the sport, much mm. consideration back in the day, if yeah. I remember right. Yeah, yeah. So no, there was no real education to it. No, was not, not at all. So, yeah. so we was going with the, obviously the the, the the mitts that they got in the gym and so forth. For, I don't think I actually had me had gloves for a, for a very long time. Mm. Uh, and the actual my first four fights, I actually boxed in someone else's boots. Yeah. One of the one of my, my teammates basically borrowed me his boots. That's, I boxed in them, yeah, uh, yeah, and then yeah. after my four fight, believe it or not, it was the parents of this kid mm. that actually bought him my first pair of boots. Yeah, that's. So, uh, Mad, you know, yeah, and, and, and help me on the journey. Yeah, but you remember these people for massively, doing something like yeah, that. Massively, something course, that yeah. might have been quite small to them, but yeah. to you, no, it, was, it meant the world. So, what, who was your favourite fighter, sort of, at the start? At the start, obviously, uh, it was around the time, probably, what was it, uh, eighty-eight, eighty-nine. 
just the Hagler Hearns, Nigel yeah, Bain. Yeah, yeah. Them were the sort of people that I was sort yeah. of watching at the time. I was a massive fan of, of Leonard. I loved the, how he used to float around that ring, yeah, his yeah. style, the different savvy that he bought. Thomas Hearns, again, I loved the, that kind of, you know, he was a fantastic fight, big puncher, yeah. had a lot of style about him. And then on the on the flip side to that, I loved Mike Tyson. Mm. Just that all that he used to bring into the ring, yeah, the way he used yeah. to just wipe people, you know, Absolutely. wipe people away. He was a brilliant fighter. So, and uh, I suppose uh, in Britain, you know, one of my favourite fighters over here at that time would have been Nigel Bean. Oh yeah. Uh, I remember yeah, being yeah. heartbroken when he first lost to Chris Eubanks so yeah, over here yeah. at the NEC. A fantastic fight, but uh, yeah, Nigel Bean was uh, definitely Class. One of great one of times, weren't they? Yeah, Absolutely brilliant time great in boxing. Times. So let's just, with your amateur career, talk to me about your, your amateur career and, and how that well went. It sounds like you had a fantastic sort of first season. Yeah, I mean, stop, stop. I mean, what, that literally made me open class. I think I beat the England champion in the quarterfinals mm. and it literally made me an open class fight with only eight fights under my belt. So you can wow. imagine then it was like literally, every fight I had was literally against uh, high class opposition, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. And I was a junior as well, so I'd kind of missed the schoolboys out starting at 14, 15. Mm. I'd kind of missed the schoolboys out. So there yeah. was, they'd got, Good ground in the some kids have been boxing since the age of eleven. Yeah. I took them fights on, not a problem. Mm. Sixty odd fights, forty odd fights, not a problem, even though I was still, you know, just just hitting double figures, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Uh to be honest, uh after that season as I say, I carried on, went back to the gym. I remember having a, a, a winning season, the season after that. Mm. Uh, and then literally as it started going on, I think got to about the age of seventeen. Another winning season. I think I had eight that year and won them all. Mm. This uh, is your amateur club. What was your amateur club? Amateur club. I was at Lakeside ABC at the time. It was okay. my first ever club that I boxed for. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah, literally, I got to about the age of seventeen. And my dad then really, I was I was a keen footballer. I was very good at football as a kid. Mm. Uh, and so I was on that route. And trials for for West Brom and, and and literally, you know, played at a good level. Uh, mm. Played for the district and, and and so forth. So. My dad wanted me to go down the football path. Yeah. Although he was a you know a keen boxing fan, mm. uh, he wanted me to go down the football path for obviously for obvious reasons. And yeah, my mum just yeah. didn't want me boxing as well. I remember getting me medical before I had my medical. Yeah. Uh, talking about that literally when I was going to talk. This is how I got carded up. So we're in the gym, and obviously I, I think at the time, and this is why I kind of look at all the kids. I didn't actually look that great on the bags mm. and doing other stuff. And I remember the coach Les saying to me like, you know, literally why he said I'm going to card up these two lads. You're not ready yet. Yeah. This is like they say, you've I've been boxing that long, obviously. And he said, mm. you're not ready yet. I'm going to put them on the home show, but you're not ready yet. You'll be ready on the next one. Les, I really want to fight myself. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, I yeah. said, tell you what, let me spar him. And if I hold my own, then obviously card me as well. I kid you not. Mm. So uh, he went, go on then. So we got in there and literally, oh, I wiped the floor with these kids that were being carded. Yeah, yeah. And that's how it kind of started me off in some respect. Uh, and that was the first my parents really knew about me because I, I literally went to the gym in secret because I know my mum mm. and dad didn't really want me to do it yeah. and the first they knew about it was when I was asking them if I could have £10 to get me boxing medical at the yeah, local yeah, doc yeah. doctor sort of yeah. thing my mum was like what do you want that for and I was like me boxing medical yeah. what you know and uh, my dad didn't actually come to the first few fights mm. which I won him all and a couple of them by knockout yeah. and then he was like oh obviously yeah, you, you, you're not going to give this up because he actually thought I was just going to knock it on the head at yeah, the start yeah. you know yeah, yeah oh, it's a bit of a fad yeah. uh, and then when I come back with these winning trophies how would you get on son yeah knocked mm. him out that first round or whatever yeah, it might yeah. be and so good. then he, he come involved and when he got involved he, I wouldn't say got to, well, yeah, yeah I suppose in some respects he did get very heavily involved where he got to the stage where my dad was keen on matter from running and stuff like that yeah so you know, I used to win the cross country at school every year purely because mm. he used to go right. You can come with me. Yeah, yeah and He yeah, took yeah. me on these yeah. long runs and whatever. He got very involved in the in the boxing side, not in terms of trying to build my technique up or anything, but mm. in terms of the fitness side. Yeah, yeah. So I'd be, you know, I'm taking the dog for a walk. You can come for a run. Mm. You know, and it was that sort of thing. And he was taking me over to me uncle who was a, a world cup uh, kickboxing champion back in the day. Yeah. So I'd go over to his gym in the off seasons. Mm. You know, when everyone, you know, back then it was like you'd finish in May, you wouldn't yeah. start again till September. You did have a proper mm. break, not like today with box yeah, cups yeah. and what have you. Yeah. And so, in that tight downtime where most of the kids would go away, because he was only in a social club, so literally you wouldn't go go to the club at that time. I was still going to my uncles and I was still training and I was still doing bits around it. So, mm. that's so when I got to about 17, I remember uh, my dad saying, like, You know, don't worry, Les, I'm going to keep them ticking over and all the rest of it. And he said, Look, Dave, give him, give him a break. Yeah, give him a bit of a break. You know, he's, he's done really well this year, and he's mm. been busy. He's, you know, he's give him a break, and, and unfortunately, that break, I never came back. Oh right. So literally, I stopped boxing. Yeah, but yeah. There and then, uh, yeah. found seventeen, eighteen, found wine, uh, found wine, women, and song. Yeah, uh, all right, uh, okay. Kind of went off the rails. Yeah. Uh, to be and honest. And then for how long? Uh, I'll be honest, uh, a good few years. Yeah. Probably three years, three years, at least three, four years, mm -hmm. uh, where I just I like this lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. When I was boxing, my dad used to me as a younger man. I remember, like, you know, 
girls had knocked the door kind of thing to say, you know, he's way in there. My dad was like, oh, he's not in. I've only found mm. out the day after. He was like, you don't keep away from them women. So yeah, yeah. I kind of, in that period, I kind of found out why. <laughs> right. You know, in some respects, I'd just go off the rails and uh, started drinking. Couldn't really handle the drink as, uh, as I say, being quite a thick lad, mm. it'd go straight to your system. And I think without having the boxing as a tool for me, which, as I say, as a young kid, I was very aggressive, short-tempered, yeah. and the boxing controlled me completely. Mm. Got me into the stage where I could like, literally you literally have to hit me to, to get anything out of me. Yeah, uh, yeah. Words would no, mean nothing, but at the time it was, you don't have to look at me the wrong way and I'd, I'd want to have a fight. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'd really calm me down the boxing ad. Mm. And I think, obviously, that was part of my life that I needed back because yeah. uh, I went into this thing where I was fighting uptown and mm. I, I got the, the, the image that we've got today or the image that I took into the boxing ring of the mad dog. It didn't actually come yeah, from yeah. the boxing oh, days. It come from that era. Right, where okay. I nearly got uh, done for manslaughter. Oh, right, okay. Uh, it wasn't me, thankfully. You know, we got mm. into a bit of a, a fight, and, and, and another black lad, uh, one of my pals, literally did someone he did it on the curb, unfortunately, and, and passed away. Right. Uh, I got roped in for that. Obviously, everyone yeah. knew me as a, yeah, an ex-fighter, yeah. and yeah. so I got pulled into the police station. That was all over central news and all that yeah, back yeah. in the day. So, so was that the point where you sort of started to go back towards the? Gym? I wish it was, but it wasn't. It wasn't. Mm. I still carried on being reckless. Yeah. Uh, obviously didn't go down the kid had you know admitted mm. put his hands up and said you know it was me it wasn't mm. him and, and i got away with that and yeah it should have really been the, the kick up the backside but unfortunately it wasn't for me uh the the turning point for me and this is a, the worst thing about it is really it's tragedies in life that have lent to I've, I've always turned a tragedy into a positive yeah uh that's my mentality of it and literally uh carried on being reckless and one of my best pals uh they were right at the time like we was a uh, Having a bit of a, a well, I've come back from a night out to be fair. Mm. Uh, I don't know what I was doing, all sorts of bloody gear, you know, as you do, try and keep yourself awake a bit longer and drink a bit more and mm. all the rest of it. And he, said, and he just said that night, he'd like literally give me a bit of a, a revelation. He said, like, you know, what what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. You know, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, he's a good yeah. fighter, you need to get back in the gym. At this time, mm. my dad was always badgering me about getting me, you're going to start the boxing back and yeah. so forth. I'm sure, dad, you know, if I'm interested in all that now, you know. Yeah. So yeah, this me pal basically says to me, you know, we need to start back into the gym. Now he'd done mm. a bit of boxing with me in the past, obviously, and he said, yeah, let's get back in the gym. You need to get back in the gym. Mm. And I was like, all right, then we'll start back the September. Uh, and literally, unfortunately for me, in the in the uh, the August of that, mm. just before we were going back to the gym, uh, when he left, he left my flat that night and and, and hung himself, unfortunately, oh, uh, committed suicide. Right. Okay. Uh, after leaving my flat, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was devastated. Yeah. But if he, if he hadn't have had that conversation... Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. So I would probably be, he led me to get back into mm -hmm. the gym. And I remember thinking at the time, like literally I was at the, the funeral and oh, I was now determined I was going to get back in the gym. Yeah, I'm gonna get, yeah, I'm yeah. Gonna get, In your yeah. memory, I'm going to come back and I'm going to yeah, see how good I am. I'm going to see how yeah, good I am. Absolutely. So let's, let's do this. So yeah. I started back in the in the September and literally I went back to this club and it was a different club I went to. I, I'd moved on to a, for a different club. My club had folded in that time mm -hmm. and they'd, they'd moved on to another gym and sort of, sort of joined. Yeah. I went back to them and I looked and said, I need to go in the IBAs. Mm. And they went, you're mad. What was the club was, that you went oh, to? 21, I went to, I went, I went, at the start I went to Kozal ABC at the time, mm. uh, who I'd boxed for right at the end, because I, mm. sort of, I sort of joined up. Yeah. Uh, and he was like, you, you're mad? Not a chance. You mm. know, you've been out the gym how long? And you want to go in the elite championships? Yeah, yeah. I said, I need to do this. I really mm. do. I need mm. to do this for my friend. In that time, what he hadn't seen is, because the old Wayne was the sort of kid that when you went out of the gym, and all the lads went for a run. Mm -hmm. I used to run to the nearest bus shelter, mm -hmm. hide while yeah. they run around the lake a couple oh, really? of times and then come yeah, back yeah, out yeah. at the end yeah. of it. Uh, I was the sort of kid that when you're doing the plank, I was lying down on the floor, yeah. looking around at everyone. And I'd so go up to just watch my... naturally talented, could do it without the hard Never work. Never trained. And all the well, lads used to go absolutely crazy yeah. because I'd only turn up when it comes to sparring. You know, yeah, yeah. Spine. I remember all the lads moaning back then, like going, oh, no, he's only done that because he's not trained, you know, yeah. I didn't, didn't put a shift in. Mm -hmm. I was the type of kid that hit the bags three or four times and then go, what are you doing later? You, you're going yeah. to yeah, You know, yeah, I yeah. didn't, I, I loved fighting, I didn't enjoy the training, I don't, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so anyway, in this period of time, I actually did start training. I started yeah. going, uh, religiously, I'd probably run two, three times a day yeah. when the gym wasn't open sort of thing to get this fitness level kind of up. And I come back and I said, I'm ready, I'm not going to mess yeah. about. Yeah. I'm going to try and I'm actually going to, for the first time in my life, dedicate yeah, yeah. myself totally yeah. to boxing. Yeah, in, in memory of your friend? In memory of my friend. I really right, wanted yeah. to do it to him, uh, do it for him, I should yeah. say. And uh, So yeah, I came back to the gym and they, they sort of knocked me back and said, look, you know, not a chance, we're not putting you in. Mm. You know, you've been out of the way for that time. You can No warm-up fights or anything else. So I got in contact with one of the guys Believe it or not, not far from this store, it was a, a box for Erdington ABC. Mm. 
uh, and there were two seniors that used to be at the Lakeside Club with me. Mm. They'd formed their own club, and so I went to them, literally saying, "I really need to enter these these championships, you know. Yeah. Please, Paul, you know, put me in them." And uh, he said, well, "We've got nothing to lose. We're a, we're a new club, you know." Mm. They knew they believed in my ability. They'd seen me as a young kid coming yeah, through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they entered me into the like, ABA Championships, mm. uh, no warm up fights, yeah. straight into it. And uh, wow. I remember well, one of the godfathers of, of, of boxing, really, especially in this part of the world, a guy called Frank O'Sullivan, who's mm. Birmingham City's head coach, mm. uh, saying that he, he thought it was crazy sort of going into them with no warm ups and just going yeah. straight into them. But yeah. I got so much belief in myself that what I could do and what I could achieve yeah. that I ended up that year going, marching right the way through to the ABA finals. Oh, fantastic. Uh, Few stoppages in the first rounds, beat yeah. the favourite in the in the semi finals down in Portsmouth, yeah. uh, boxing the elite finals, and then I felt the chance got robbed from me when I got three standing counts when in no real, uh, mm. I wasn't really hurt. Yeah, I was okay. Yeah. I'd been hit harder in the rounds before, to be fair, and, mm. and, and I found out after that the referee was from the same area as the kid I was oh, boxing, right. okay. and he yeah. got struck off. But that's another story. But yeah. literally, that ripped my heart away. Yeah, yeah, uh, stopped me achieving that goal. Mm. So I walked away from the sport again. Right, okay. So 21 years of age. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. walked away and thought, forget this boxing. Remember, mm. it weren't, you didn't have your team GBs and stuff then. Mm. So me walking away from the sport was kind of, there was no money in it. I was like, what am I doing mm. this for? Yeah. You know, I wanted to I wanted to box for England. That was my, mm. my, my name. And, and that got ripped away from me. And I remember coming out of the ABAs and literally uh, the vest got took away and someone else, uh, uh, Steve Bendel at the time, mm. who I boxed later on as a mm. pro, obviously, he was the number one guy who had that vest, yeah. and I really wanted to fight him, but it never came off. I remember going over to try him, to try and call him out, really, and spar him, mm-hmm. whatever, and try and make this fight, him, but it never really kind of happened, and I didn't really cross paths with Steve back in the amateurs then. Yeah. Uh, a junior started coming through, I think it was Darren Rhodes, uh, took the England vest after Steve Bender went pro, and mm. so again, I was like, you know, this isn't that before me, so I kind of walked away from the sport. And how long was you away from the sport then? For about four years, three, four years Wow. Ago. So, like, Considering the career you had after, that's oh, incredible, really. Oh, I said, look, you know, we 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 done a, a, a for me, I feel I underachieved mm. uh, well, in the sport massively you missed because out, I didn't you? really get the chances, uh, and it's all about having breaks in life. But I did mm. make the most of them when I got them. So yeah, don't yeah. get me wrong, I don't look yeah. back at my career and think, oh, you know, I've got it regret. There wasn't regrets. No, I achieved, be. I achieved a hell of a lot yeah. with the time that I had. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, so yeah. yeah, so literally, I done them. But I was thirty six bouts at that time. Mm. Uh, five defeats yeah. as a career. Uh, Went away, come back. After, yeah. After how long? Four years. Well, no, it, it didn't really happen like that. So when I finished the ABAs, I walked mm. away from the sport completely. Yeah. My daughter was born Chelsea and uh, just living a different life, you know, forget mm. the boxing. Mm. I wouldn't mention it with you if me and you was together. I wouldn't mention I even boxed, mm. you know. And, and so literally I've got a job. I was a BT engineer. Yeah. And I loved the job, to be fair. It was a great job. And I carried on doing that job right up until I, I fought for my first title as a pro, mm. you know, uh, so I enjoyed that job and I thought this is my career and I just moved forward with that and I put the boxing to bed. Yeah. My dad again was going, you know, I mean, because he he like he was buzzing, I'd come back out of retirement yeah, and he yeah, followed yeah. me all the way through the ABAs. Uh, so I'm at BT, my daughter's there, I'm, I'm not even in the gym, I'm not mm-hmm. even going to the gym, I'm just working 24-7 for, for BT and, and I forgot the boxing, so to speak. Uh, chance meeting at work, not mm-hmm. far from here, this is the area I used to cover, believe it or not, where the shop is, this is where I used to work for BT and stuff, yeah. but a chance meeting at work led to a guy talking about a, uh, a pro boxer who was having his, for, he, was, he was moving up there as a top amateur mm-hmm. uh, from Leicester, Neil Linford, mm-hmm. uh, and he mentioned this Neil Linford, and to be fair, just before the end of my uh, amateur career, that approached the, I'd got offered the Neil Linford fight, he was a junior star, mm-hmm. I think he'd never lost for England and all that sort of stuff, and I'd been approached for this fight, and so this guy mentioned him. I went, I know, I know who he is. Well, mm. how do you know him? He's from Leicester. Yeah. I went, well, they did actually, because both Midlands lads, obviously, and I was probably, well, I would have been higher in the rating, so I probably wanted to take that scalp. Yes. They, they approached me for that fight, and he was like, sure up. And I went, no, seriously, they did. He went, you, 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 you're lying. He said, why well, have you never mentioned boxing before? You never mentioned you boxed before. I said, yeah. well, why would I? I'm not boxing yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, he said, I'll ring this guy's trainer up. I kid you not. He said, I'll ring this guy's trainer up. So uh, he rang his trainer. And he said, Jez, I've got this guy here. He said, he reckons he's nearly 40 or nil. Mm. And literally, uh, he put me on the phone to him. Mm. And uh, he said, how you doing, mate? He said, you know, bloody hell. Do you want to come over and do a bit of sparring with Neil? Mm. I said, mate, I haven't boxed for oh, four years, three, four years. I haven't been yeah. in the gym. Yeah. He went, I remember you. He said, fast kid. 
big point. She mm. said, you know, you don't lose it. He said, come on, we'll play you a couple of quid. Come over, we're struggling for sparring big time. Yeah. He said, you never know, it might open a few doors for you. Yeah. So I kind of got the book back. Rewinding and, and just before that period, and we're looking at probably six months before that, uh, it was the darkest and worst time mm. of my life. Mm. I separated from my partner of my daughter. Mm. Uh, and I just got a call from my uncle to say my dad had been killed in a car accident. Oh, right. So whether you look at pairs above or whatever you yeah, want to call yeah, it, yeah. I don't know. It was yeah. really strange because I remember going to the funeral and he went to live in Barbados. He separated from him and went to live in mm. Barbados and I had to go to the Barbados for the first ever time. Yeah. I remember him ringing me saying, you need to come over. So I said, Dad, I haven't got time. I'm working and work. So first time I'm going there, so I actually arranged his funeral and to mm. bury him, which was mm. gutting. Went over there and... Uh, loads of people coming up to me at the funeral like, you're the son he's told me about your boxing mm. and you're a great boxer mm. and I thought oh, I'm, not, I'm not even boxing yeah, so yeah. it was strange because the thought was there but there was no actual yeah. having you to get into it Yeah, yeah. so I remember sitting there on this rock and looking out into the sea and by about this round by, not far from the cemetery in Christchurch and thinking dad I'm going to give this boxing a go when I get back but not actually knowing why but then this chance mm. of meeting at work led to that so a bit of a strange one yeah, if you look at Pairs of Book. But yeah, anyway, yeah, so I go, I, I go over and we, we start we start training and I get, I've got the book now. I'm getting up yeah. at half four in the morning. Mm. I'm running, going to do my day job. Travelling to Leicester. Yeah. Uh, it was Tony Simpson's pub, actually, uh, the, mm. the adventurous pub. So I met Tony Simpson as well, which yeah, is obviously yeah. a member from the Agla days. Yeah, and that was a massive buzz for me to yeah, meet him yeah. and the uh, inspiration. Mm. And so, yeah, I started getting into the train. I'm training, you know, train, go to Leicester, train there, come back, go for another run. Mm. I literally just mm. went for that and I thought, I'm not getting the opportunity here, you know. Yeah, yeah. He was signed up by uh, Kevin Sanders and Frank Maloney and they ended up being my first managers. So, so did you go back into the amateurs? This is the funny thing, so I start training mm. and uh, I'm mega fit now, I feel really good yeah. and I decide that I'm gonna, I can't go out on a loss. Mm. My last fight was a loss. Yes. So I win the Birmingham title of the Elite. Right, okay. So this was back in the day before internet and all the rest yeah, of it. So literally, yeah. I, go into the, I go into the Elite Championships. Now I'm a, not pro, I haven't been signed up. I've just mm. been doing the training with the pros and doing the pro training when I thought, let's see how I can get on. Yeah. So I actually went into these championships at light middleweight. Okay. And that's the training that just like <laughs> wiped me down. And, mm. uh, so I went in at light middleweight. I can't go on a loss. I've got to, got to go on a win. Yeah. So I went in. Wins the Birmingham round, mm. and then pull out. Right, so okay. I, got no I don't want to. Eat. I, yeah, I yeah. hate. Yeah. At this time, I hate the amateur boxing yeah, because yeah. of what I felt that it done to me, and mm. I felt it robbed me of the chance of winning the elite title. Mm. So I wasn't into amateur boxing. I, I just want to get out of it. But yeah. I ain't going on a loss. Mm. So let's get a win. So I actually won. Yeah. And then come away from it. I weren't interested in the next rounds on. It was just yeah. like that. Right, let's get my pro career started now. Let's uh, get signed cool. up. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, I then got a phone call not long after that. Like literally, everyone had pulled out all the way through. Yeah. So I'm literally sitting like potentially in the quarterfinals of the ABAs. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah. at this time, with the extra training and the time period that's gone by and so forth, mm. uh, and no real connection or contact with my old amateur club, I went back in with, with obviously we've heard into the game. Yeah. Uh, no contact with them. Literally, I'm getting a phone call to say, oh, "What's your weight like?" And what like, oh, this time I'm well overweight because right. now I'm starting to do more weight training because mm. I'm going to professional. So I'm actually building into the physique that yeah. I went into as a, as a, which was a walk around rate of probably around about 12, 4, 12, 5. Yes. As, yeah, a, yeah. as a pro, I'm sort of built, I've like bulked up, mm. draw myself down, get down to 11, 6, and I get back in at 12, 6. So I was kind of like round, probably about 12, 3, 12, 4. There was no way I was going to make lot, uh, light middle, which in the amateurs, as you know, is even lighter. It was back mm. then. They've mm. changed it now, haven't they? Mm. But it used to be 11 stone, so there's no way I was making 11 yeah. stone. Uh, no, 11 2, I should 11, say. 11 yeah. There's no way I was going to make it. Yeah. So that was that gone. But I weren't mm. interested anyway. It was, mm. it was strange how it came about. And then obviously uh, signed up. We started sparring basically in the. Uh, this is how I got found. We'd started sparring. They wanted to see me doing a little bit of sparring. Mm. So I went down doing a little bit of sparring. And uh, to be honest, you're uh, Felt literally I got owned in the first round, you know, Neil mm. was a good inside fighter, a great inside fighter, and that wasn't my style, I was more of a, a counter puncher, someone who boxed on the back foot a little bit more, yeah. I could punch but I'd lead you onto shots, mm. uh, so I didn't do too great in the first, I think that was just because the, there was someone there, the pressure yeah. uh, of wanting to be fresher and what have you, and then not come back and I just said, oh, do what you do best, mate, yeah, yeah, boxing, yeah. And, yeah. and that's what I did, and it was supposed to go a little bit longer than what it did, and then ended up cutting it short. Mm. Uh, and literally, he came round to me and he was like, what, what club do you box for? I said, I don't box for any club, you know, yeah, I work for that's, mad, so that's it. And they were like, you're joking. You know, you've got so much ability, so can you send me a video down? So yeah. I literally sent a video down to him of the ABA run that I mm. had and whatever. And they went, like, hey, did we miss you? Yeah, yeah. And I said, well, at the end of it all, before 
this period I rang round I actually rang Paddy Lynch who ended up being my trainer in the mm. end uh, I rang his lad Rob McCracken was there at the time yeah. I rang his yard and said like you know sign me up you know they're yeah. like sorry he's not taking it on at the minute and you know I didn't even get to speak to Paddy I spoke to someone else in the background going like you know can't help you Wayne yeah. Paddy Earns you know Frank well, yeah. everyone I was ringing around saying you know I want to turn professional mm. you know I've had enough of the amateur I want to turn pro but everyone sort of knocked me back what was your amateur career record then? 37 so mm. I would have ended up with 37 points and right. 5 defeats in the end yeah 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 and then you turned pro um, obviously you're back well into the training yeah um, did you do with your training did you do much sparring? Do you know what I, I did when I was it when I was when I started off? We done a fair bit of spine, obviously, because uh, Neil Neil was my main man. He was busy, he was building up his full spot. Starry David Starry Brian McGee. Mm. So obviously, I was helping him out and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah. plenty of sparring right at the start. Went to London, same sort of thing. Loads of sparring. Mm. Uh, it tailed off a little bit when I was with Paddy Lynch, to be fair, yeah. where we didn't do as much sparring purely mm. because. He said that he obviously had, I think it was his 14th British champion. He'd had mm, Costa mm. Petru, Pat Caldell, you know, Huey mm. Ford, so many yeah. great fighters. Yeah. And he said that literally a lot of them had left it in the gym. Right. And he felt okay. that was over sparring and yeah. over training. And, and so I suppose I got the benefit of that really mm. because he really looks at, you know, when, we were, when he was tailoring my programs for fights and stuff, yeah. he'd kind of tailor it down. So he was, I mean, I remember doing me sparring. I remember when I first went to him and we'd done a sparring, it was like a four round sparring. You're like, what? You know, we're paying this guy to come down here and spar me. Yeah. And we've done like four rounds. He yeah. loved it. It was like, anytime you want me, Wayne, I'll come back. And I was yeah, like, I bet yeah, you will. You know, really, yeah, I'm four rounds. Yeah. And he was stopping. And I remember questioning Paddy at the time and saying, Paddy, you know, like, literally in, in London, I was like doing 10 rounds here. You know, mm. and you're doing four rounds. Yeah. Am I going to be all right? Like, we've got a 12 round fight. It's four, four here. Yeah. You'll be fine, Wayne. And you know what? Oh, I was. Yours, yeah. We'd only do real, we'd probably do eight rounds right at the end of it. Mm. But mm. a lot of it, he was looking for the quality yeah, rather than the quantity. And he kind yeah. of slowed it down. And, as I say, I've done 12 rounds quite comfortably uh, a, num a, a number of times. So for me, obviously, he was doing doing it right. Yeah. So with your sparring equipment back then, uh, what what gloves did you wearing? You know, I'll tell you, when I started off, obviously, uh, as, as most boxers will find, it's a very difficult sport and, and money's tight and whatever else. And uh, I started off, I think, and I was wearing, a, I was actually wearing twins gloves mm -hmm. when I started uh, mm -hmm. because they were cheapest chips, I'll be honest. Yeah. You could get them from Thailand at the time and they were dead cheap. And I remember... Mm -hmm. I was going, when you go over, they get me a pair of twins gloves, mate. Yeah. So I was kind of, that was my favourite glove. In terms of longevity, they felt they were really strong and durable. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I found, uh, I struggled with my wrist. So literally, I broke my wrist in a pair of twins gloves. Yeah, yeah. Because there wasn't the wrist protection on them. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember hooking someone in a spa and literally breaking my wrist. Yeah. Uh, and not realising, and then coming back, obviously they put me in the cast and whatever, and I come back and then I sparred again. Obviously, wouldn't change my gloves. Didn't put it down to my gloves. Mm -hmm. And again, I always say to the kids as well, make sure I probably didn't wrap, bring my wraps back as far as what I should yeah. have as well to yeah. give me extra support. Yeah. But obviously, I always blamed the gloves because I come back and actually broke it again. Yeah, yeah. And that was me and twins sort of done. I was mm. like, I ain't doing that again because yeah. they, I didn't get the support that I wanted. Uh, I then bought my first set of Rays, right. uh, Cleto Rays. Yeah. And, and, uh, what ounce? 16 ounce. 16 ounce, uh, yeah. Redhead guard, uh, cheek guard, yeah. red groin guard. Believe it or not, that cheek groin guard and head guard I wore for the uh, in preparation for the charity fight I had only two years ago. It's oh, like really? 20 years yeah, old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The gloves are hanging up in the yeah, shop. I you'll you'll that, see yeah. them later. You know, they're 20 yeah. years old. Yeah. Uh, I remember nearly crying when I come out of the shop when we was in London because I've mm. moved to London at that time. And I was nearly crying when I come out of the shop with the price I had to pay for the full set. Yeah. Uh, but I thought it was the right move to make. I felt that if I want to be a champion, I've got to have champions. Yeah. Uh, so, head guard, groin guard. And, and, and gloves and gloves yeah yeah i bought yeah. the full set of red set yeah did you with with your trainers did you wear a groin guard in your sparring right from the start or because a lot of people no uh, no i'll be honest i never uh i didn't or if i did it was a very cheap and, yeah, and yeah. nasty one yeah. probably a probably not a, a, a cheap title one or something anything yeah. was knocking in the gym it wasn't really yeah, bothered yeah. yeah i bought that and yeah. i just throw that on i didn't it? really have my own kind of guard mm -hmm. i mean I, even for me fights, I think that the first few fights I had, I think it was a, it was a place called Contender Boxing. Do you remember Contender yeah, Boxing? Yeah, yeah. It was, That's it. it was the mecca. Yeah. It, was, it was one of my inspirations for starting my dog boxing. Yeah, yeah. Was John yeah. Coyle. I used to love going yeah. over there and looking at the pictures of the wall of him, counting out Nigel Ben and and, yeah. and, and, and just. I went across with Spencer. Spencer take over Spencer Alton took over it, the yeah. ex-pro boxing referee. Yeah, he yeah. took over it after. But yeah, so back in the day, I'd go to Contender. My first pro shorts were made by John, mm. Uh, mm. and I remember going over there, and I think I had a Contender. Contender yeah, groin yeah. guard for yeah. when I was boxing. Uh, my, my first gloves were a contender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I love Johnny. You know, he's a great man, and 
you know, his knowledge of the sport was great. So yeah, mm. really good shop. So that's that was gonna say one of my one of my biggest inspirations for this place. Yeah, yeah. And and that was when I came here last week, that was kind of the the feel that I got of the sort of a boxing shop where not only have you got the gear but you've got the, the experience and someone to talk to. Yeah. N not just about the gear but your experience that you could pass on to anybody that comes in here. It's things that have happened to you yeah. that other people can sort of benefit from when it comes to protecting their hands, protecting their wrists, protecting everything really. And and, and this shop is from just ev from brilliant. every area I've served my apprenticeship yeah. right the way through from the AMS it wasn't, you know, through 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 the pros and so yeah, and obviously then going into the to the amateur coaching and then the, the professional coaching of, mm -hmm. of recent. So yeah. I think I've done a full circle really. Yeah, I've kind yeah, of been absolutely. every part of the sport. Yeah. And then when you come to uh, the fight gloves, yeah. obviously did you they just supply the fight gloves at as first? As a champion I could choose. And then you uh, could choose as a champion. As a choose as a champion I could choose. Uh, starting off with Panics Promotions who had Lennox Lewis at the yeah. time. Howard yeah. Eastman obviously uh, mm -hmm. who used to box on a lot of his undercards when I started off. Yeah. It was whatever gloves they gave you. Mm. Nine times out of ten, they were decent. I mean, yeah. but I used to buzz every time they give me a pair of rayers. I was yeah, like, he's yeah. getting knocked out today. <laughs> I feel great <laughs> today. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I used to love wearing the rayers. Obviously, mm. uh, it was generally rayers. Uh, I think they'd done a spat with BBE. It depends because if the promoter had a tie up with a, a yeah. certain uh, supplier, then that that's what you wore. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I remember. But obviously, if I had the opportunity, then I'd always try and go for the rayers gloves because for me, it was kind of knew I could. Uh, Give him a good bloody hiding, hopefully, with these with yeah, these gloves. So yeah. yeah. So with your career, just just going through. Yeah. Um, Anthony Farnell is really the first name that sort of jumps out at me. But was there anybody before that that you uh, sort of had any a tough fight against? Do you know what? I, I really, I probably didn't. To be fair, mm. uh, if I'm honest, probably the toughest one was probably the uh, was probably the uh, the Darren Rhodes fight, the first one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, this one here now, you look, he's had 14 fights, it was my third fight, yeah, yeah. so you can yeah. imagine why it'd be quite tough, yeah. but it was at the Velodrome, I remember literally being there, and uh, it was my first fight, we, I was with Panics Promotions, things were going great, so I had a couple of fights there mm. uh, against Pollard and, and Webster, I had then a couple of fights, and then uh, Frank Maloney at the time left mm. and went and teamed up with Frank Warren at Sports Network, yeah. and I stayed at Panics. Okay. Uh, offered more money and all the rest of it and I was a bit naive and I didn't really have a manager I was kind of my own man sort of thing mm. and just felt grateful that I actually got into the sport again Yeah. Uh, so I stayed where I was and literally had a massive period of inactivity so the distance between them fights you'll see is probably about 15 months or something mm. and this is while I was in limbo uh, yeah. Jez Brogan uh, while Neil was on the circuit bumped into Frank Maloney as well what happened to that black kid he's mm. like you know where is he you know good kid what, what happened to him yeah. I was getting a bit dis disillusioned at the time because mm. I was like training for these fights and he was like oh man you know he fights he's pulled out and whatever and yeah. I weren't getting I weren't getting any bouts. So uh literally Frank said, Tell him to give me a call and you know, so I literally teamed back up with Frank yeah. at Sports Network. Mm -hmm. And I think Sports Network were like, Who's this kid? You know, he's come out of nowhere. He's not he's not like he's a young kid. I was getting on, I think I was about twenty seven, then yeah, you know, you're looking yeah. at another couple of years on. Yeah. Uh so literally we want to see if he can actually fight. Mm -hmm. So they made this fight against Darren, obviously and Darren had, had fourteen fights or whatever at the time, it's yeah. fourteen fights. So it was a massive ask for someone who's only going into his third fight mm -hmm. against someone who's only uh, had one yeah. loss and one on points. How many rounds was that? It was only a four rounder. A four rounder. Uh, yeah. I'll be honest with you, it was mm. tough. <laughs> mm. But a lot of it was down to. He was at the Velodrome. It was the same night that uh, Tackle who got uh, knocked out Anthony Farnell. Right. Okay. That was my yeah. first ever fight for him at the uh, Manchester Vol Velodrome. Yeah. And I remember literally uh, sitting at ringside, was getting ready, and I used to love to soak the atmosphere up before a box. So I'd go and I was sitting at ringside and I'm watching the bouts. Uh, with my coach and whatever and, and literally get a tap on the shoulder like Wayne you, you, you're on next yeah yeah what and literally I kid you not I literally got up out the chair walked out of one side of the arena walked all the way around mm -hmm. at the next set of doors I'm putting my gloves on yeah and I'm getting in the ring wow so you yeah, know yeah. you could really say I wasn't really warmed up mm -hmm. so and it made it tough and so the first couple of rounds for me I was like really yeah it was tough to I was kind of warming up while I was getting in there mm -hmm. uh, it was close you can argue I won it mm -hmm. uh and I remember he's trying to sort of tell him, you know, you, you didn't win that fight, Wayne, and whatever. And yeah, it was some of the, it was a bit of a uh, a pain for me really every time because you know I knew it was a close fight, but I thought like you know at the end of the day he's had what, fourteen fights or whatever, you know, really he should have walked the floor with me. I'm on yeah. the third fight, I'm a, a, a ranked novice, yeah, so yeah, definitely, yeah. So that's state yeah. sort of state of me. So that was quite a tough one purely because of that. Uh, yeah. Valerio uh, Din, uh, if you look back at the box wreck yeah. things, he was probably a stone heavier than me at least. Oh, was he? he was a big lot everywhere. I remember Charlie Giles coming into the changing room to me mm. before him. Charlie Giles is the 
uh, chairman of the boxing board at the moment. Yeah. He wasn't, he was a Midlands area, but he came into me and he said, like, literally, don't get in. Does you mean? He said, this kid weighed in the scales yesterday. He was like, yeah. Milestone then. Do you know what I mean? I was yeah. about 11 6 on the night. You know what I mean? He's like, yeah. he's yeah. massive. So and I remember Enzo Calzaghi coming in mm. and saying to me, like, literally, come in the change because he's on a joke. He, was, he, he got a Bradley, uh, who'd he got on there? Gavin Reese. Mm. Uh, I can't remember the other skipper last night. I don't mean, he's got, they were talking, he was in Wales anyway, and he came to the change room and he said, like, uh, you're lads out there. Mm. I said, man, my size is, you know, I'll point my chest out. He yeah, said, yeah, yeah. he's joking. He said, he's twice the size of you, I wouldn't let him fight out, Joe. <laughs> what really? yeah. And I literally, I thought, God, I'm, I'm, I'm in for a, I'm in for a big, uh, I'm in for a, for, a, for a tough fight here. I remember mm. getting in the ring and I was with my old amateur coach who I'd brought back on board, to be fair, from Erding, from the Erdington days. Mm. And I brought him back on board and we boxed down there. And, I remember like looking across the ring and thinking, he was huge. I mm. mean, when you're saying this guy weren't out of shape, he was a, yeah. a guy and a Nigerian or something like that. He was yeah. or French guy, and I think he was at the yeah. time. And uh, he was massive. He got his hair dyed blonde. He was massive. I thought he looked like Wesley Snipes. <laughs> you know, I thought I'm going to get hammered here. And I remember my coach saying he got these like the tiger like leopard skin shorts on or whatever. Mm. I remember Joe saying to me at the time. This, he thinks he's turned up for fancy dress this guy I know it sounds mad but sometimes that's what a coach can do for you yeah, yeah. he kind of like just took the fear mm. away kind of thing like, yeah what an idiot look look at them shorts you know and he's, yeah, yeah. he kind of took the edge off it for it I'm not really scared of you wearing them shorts you can't be that good you know it was yeah. one of them ones I don't know mm. but uh, it worked anyway and I remember the boxing news report is the ball against the Matador right, I actually okay. won that fight and it looked like I'd actually put him down in one round so I never had that because mm. he actually picked me up he got so frustrated I think in the third round that he actually picked me up and threw me on the floor Right. Okay. because uh, he couldn't catch me yeah, he kept yeah, chanting yeah. he was yeah. like literally charging towards me yeah. he was going under the ropes yeah. I, was, I was just stepping across popping mm. him and moving and yeah. I used my speed and Ernie Fossey God rest his soul a uh, mm. great man in the sport he told me the tactics to do he said just don't stand still with this kid he's a big lump Mm. Boxing, moving, you'll have the speed on this kid, and I did. Yeah. You know, he couldn't catch yeah, me. Yeah, I used that yeah. elusive. It was a middleweight against a lot heavyweight. In, in, yeah, in all fairness, yeah. But was that a four rounder as well? A four rounder, four yeah. Rounder it, well. what, I only had four round fights. Mm. Uh, the first one was a six twos, uh, which wasn't far off that anyway. Mm. It was supposed to be a four threes. Yeah. They changed it to six twos, which was a nightmare because I literally had him rocking in the last ten seconds. I mean, I remember on the video the guy laughing, yeah. literally saying, "I hope he gets through the fight in the end," because he was like, literally, yeah. I was just starting to crank up in that last minute, mm. and the bell was going. Yeah. So anyway, I'd only done that, and I was only ever doing four rounders, and then we fought Yuri Serenko, mm. who just beat Gary Lockett first, yeah. first Gary Lockett's bubble, mm. uh, beat a, a really good fighter. I say massively experienced. You look at how many fights he's had compared to myself. It was my ninth bout. Yeah. Uh, what we're looking at, he had twenty odd fights, twenty six, twenty seven fights. Mm. Good fighter, you know, very yeah, good fighter, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and a big gamble for me. In all fairness, mm. they made me uh, drop down weight because he was obviously down at light middle. Yeah. So I had to really, you know, boil down to get down. I think I weighed in about 11 to 11 three mm. on that day, so, so we could it was quite a catch weight sort of fight. Yeah, but uh, very strong. Up until that, that was a ten rounder. Up until right. then, I only ever done four rounds, wow. and even then, I hadn't completed. As you yeah, see, there's yeah. a lot of TKOs yeah, in yeah. there on yeah. that way through, so I was knocking people yeah. over. So I wasn't really getting the benefit of doing even four rounds most of the time. Mm. So it was a big ask to do a ten rounder. I remember doing, going into the fight, winning the first eight rounds, thinking, "Wow, this is easy." Yeah. You know, I was I was popping him. I was well in control. Mm. And I think watching it back on the video after, I come back at the end of the eighth round, a massive smile on my face, yeah. shown on the, on the sky camera, a massive yeah. smile on my face, and I sit back and I'm saying, Frank, this is, this is easy, you know, this is just, watch what you're doing, son. Uh, uh, and, you know, that jinx. <laughs> mm. I came out in the ninth round, it was probably the most tired ninth round that I'd had. Uh, he caught me early on, there was probably about a minute into the round, mm. caught me with a shot yeah. on the temple, and I was actually gone. Was uh, it? And I remember thinking to myself, well, thinking I was saying in my head, you know, this is my fight to lose and not yours to win. When I yeah. watched it back on the playback, I was actually saying it to him. Oh, right, okay. Uh, but actually, he must yeah. rock me that much that I'm thinking yeah, I'm yeah. saying it in my head, but I was actually yeah. saying it to him. And yeah. just that, like say, what you need in boxing, mm. that mental strength carried me through the round. I thought, I've won eight rounds, there's no way yeah. I'm letting you win this fight, mate. Yeah, and I, but I was actually telling him that while I was in there. Uh, <laughs> got through the fight, actually got through that round somehow, mm. but then come out and won the 10th. Yeah, so yeah. I, know, I learned to, you know, it was a, it was a good learn. And, and by this time, uh, I'd never been knocked out or, or or really in that kind of position ever mm. as an amateur. You know, in, yeah, in, in yeah. the amateur, even though it said the freeze done again, I wasn't in any control. I wasn't in any hurt or anything like that. So I wasn't used to that. It was a, a new area for me, mm. having to survive. I should have probably held on more than what I did. Yeah. Uh, and so forth to get through it, and uh, but it was a learning curve for me. Uh, and then, then the next one was uh, World Boxing Union, the WBU middleweight title. 
Anthony Farnell. Yeah. And they won unanimous. Yeah. Yeah, a uh, big opportunity for me on the back of the Serenko win. Obviously, that mm. elevated me up the ratings somewhat. Mm. Uh, obviously, with him beating Gary Lockett, that would have leapfrogged in, and then I leapfrogged in, and it, it put me in a position to challenge for the title. Yeah. Uh, it was only, it was short notice, and it was five or six weeks' notice for it. It was on a uh, Ricky Hatton against uh, Vince Phillips on the card. I was chief support to Ricky Hatton on the night, which was, you know, I used to choose the, the Hatton fights. I used to love watching Ricky fight mm. his style. Uh, same as Joe Calzaghe to be fair yeah, because I could yeah. sell tickets yeah. a lot of the time I'd say to them right, you know, these are the fights I wanted to go on it was good for me fans to get to it was easy for me to sell tickets with two names like that on the top of the bill of course uh, and yeah I mean uh, we, we, we boxed that we boxed it it was my first time over 12 rounds to be fair uh, I think I put him down in the 5th round mm -hmm. and uh, to be honest I probably could have turned the gas on mm -hmm. uh, earlier than that to be honest but for me in the back of my mind uh, I wanted to tick that box of doing 12 rounds yes yeah, uh, yeah. And I remember, like Frank, literally saying after the fifth round, "Come on now, let's let's get him out now, son. You know, mm -hmm. turn the screw." Mm -hmm. For me, I didn't want it. Whether yeah. I could have or not, it's another story. Yeah, yeah. you know. But I, it, it was never in my mind. But you wanted, you know. To I mean, listen, yeah, right, you know, Farnell was a tough kid. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To be fair, so whether that would have happened would have been. But in in my mind, I never wanted to do that anyway. Yeah. It was always about doing the twelve and proving to those who, well, what's this kid doing? He was only doing four mm. rounds and now he's yeah, just got a yeah. 10. Now he's doing, yeah. can he do a 12? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. this is this is Farnell's fight. Yeah. You know, Wayne, I've seen it early on in his career, he seems to knock people out early mm. doors. Mm. So if it goes past like, you know, eight rounds or whatever, then it's got to be all Farnell's territory. Yeah. And I think I took that into the fight really and I thought to myself, you know, I want to kind of be there for the 12 rounds. Yeah. And So I didn't, and at the time as well, I, I felt quite comfortable while I was in there. Mm. Didn't feel it, you know, under any threat or any time. I felt like I was controlling it yeah. off the jab and there was no reason to, to, to want to get him out there really yeah. to be fair. Let's just get these 12 out, I can do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On that night, I probably could have done 15, you know. It was yeah. like literally I felt that good at, even at the end of the fight, mm. you know. And then a, a bit of a shock against Lawrence Murphy. Oh, mate. Mate, yeah. Uh, massive mm. for my... Uh, not a shot for you know Lawrence done what he had to do in fair play to him but you know I'll be honest we'd got aspirations now after this win against Farnell and he was highly rated in the WBO I think I was number four in the WBO after mm. this rating yeah. and we'd got aspirations to go for a guy called Hector Velez mm. uh, I'd already been talked I'd already got videos of Velez yeah. before the Murphy fight you yeah, know literally yeah. like we're going to get you to go for the WBO title next is where you're going to go and mm. Uh, you can't look back on things, but yeah, I mean, X for Velez fought Oscar the Lover. Yeah, yeah, that could have yeah. been my fight, could have yeah, been, but I kept winning yeah, and stuff. Yeah. But anyway, so I'm looking at Velez while I'm preparing for Murphy. Mm -hmm. uh, the spining was against a guy called Matthew Barney, uh, who was a, a light heavyweight, mm -hmm. tall, awkward, but nowhere near replicated Murphy's style. It was completely yeah. the wrong sparring for me, yeah. Uh, but I didn't care because I thought it was just going to be an easy, easy mm -hmm. fight. So I was seeing him having, I've seen some of his fights. Our common opponents, he kind of had a, you know, oh, he's gone points, he's gone points. I've knocked him out in a round. I've yeah, done him into, yeah. you know, yeah. this is going to be a walk in the park. He was yeah, on a, a Scott Harrison bill. He was mm. topping the bill. Mm. Another one of my, my favourite fights, Scott. Yeah, I used to yeah. love watching Scott yeah. box. So again, you know, I thought he ticks all the boxes. Let's just get this out of the way. Mm. Ticking over fight and then we can move on to bigger things. Uh, I remember at the, the weighing, uh, weighing in and meeting the guy and he was very, you know, a nice guy to be fair, lovely mm. kid. And I still speak to, to Lawrence today, so mm. I just but you know, he's a good kid, but shaking his hand and whatever, you know, best to look. And I remember speaking to my assistant sort of saying, you know, I hope he's getting paid well for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah. an idiot. Well, what an idiot. Yeah. Totally looking right past him. Mm, uh, yeah. Went out there with no plan. You know, I didn't box the way I should have boxed. I remember being in the changing room and kind of going, lads, don't worry, we ain't going to be down here long. I'm going to give you an easy <laughs> night tonight. I said, you, you'll be, you, 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 I don't know, you know, I'm joking, I'm yeah, taking, yeah. taking yeah, the mick. I'm mean, in the yeah, changing yeah. room going like, yeah. you ain't even going to lift that stool up today, mate. It's going to yeah. be the, you know, the easiest yeah. money you've ever earned. Yeah. And I'm giving it all this. Mm. Uh, and as I say, you know, we went in there, unfortunately, uh, I got caught with a shock. It was a hell of a shot mm. uh, on the temple. Yeah. Took me out of the ring. Uh, completely, and, and and I come back up literally, and I remember just sitting up. Yeah, first time down. First time in my career, I've been down. Mm. Uh, so I'm in shock now. I'm like, wait, what? What am I doing here? This yeah. isn't what I envisioned. And I remember sitting up and literally looking at the referee, and he's going six, mm. seven. Because I've probably been down five, five, knocked out, caught out the ring, yeah. get back up. And he's counting me, and, I, mm. and I'm, I all remember thinking to myself at the time was literally he's counting me six, seven, and I'm thinking, and I just look at the ref, and I'm just mm. shaking me, and I'm going. I'm gonna get up. Yeah, There's yeah. no bombs. I can't get up in four seconds. You mm -hmm. That's in my head. I'm thinking oh, I can't yeah. get up in four seconds. Yeah. I've never been down. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the shock of it all. And he just came to me out. And when he came to me out, I actually stood up then. Yeah. Uh, 
and obviously they come out they did the precautionary oxygen mask and what have you but I just remember at the time like, I was a bit hurt because people thought I actually kind of threw the fight did you bet on yourself Wayne? Um, right, okay. to get, and I was like don't be stupid yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd never been down and yeah. when he came into the tent it was kind of closure for me it was like mm. oh, thank god for that you know yeah. uh, it was yeah. weird I could have got up earlier and I learnt that later on as you see you know, in the, later in the Abrams fight when I got put down the first round I was, I was up and it weren't a problem you know you can be put down yeah. it learnt me a big experience that I'm only human and, and mm. if you get caught with a good shot you can get knocked out yeah. simple not, as that or knocked down not to down. look too far forward 100% yeah massive <laughs> yeah. massive learning curve for me yeah and then just going forward then obviously you, you did fight Darren Rhodes again just before Scott Dunn for the British title yeah well we had we had two we had two bouts off the back of Murphy mm. uh, against Maswari and uh, and Monaghan yeah uh, York all both literally 12 o'clock at night sky yeah. packing the camp remember you, you've been chief support now to yeah. free events yeah. now all of a sudden you're boxing at 12 o'clock at night sky packing the cameras away they're not even mm. filming you yeah. your crowd are there from Birmingham you brought your crowd down there but the, the rest of the arena is pretty much empty yeah. uh, you're fighting in their respects with Monaghan and that more near journeyman if you like just to get you and I'm like I wasn't happy about my career so I sort of said mm. to Frank you know what's, what are you doing is this the is this it? You know, yeah. I, mean, I was just and again you're on rubbish money again because mm. you've been dropped right down from mm. fighting for titles gone back on six rounds four rounds whatever you may be yeah uh so anyway i sort of said you know what's going on he said well, it's boxing mate you lost mm -hmm. you gotta build your way back up yeah i wasn't happy about that mm -hmm. uh and i wasn't getting the juice out of them two fights mm -hmm. uh, i didn't train right for them yeah uh i was struggling i fought demons after the murphy fight i'll be honest mm -hmm. with you after the murphy fight i fought demons mm -hmm. uh it was a horrible period from being uh, everyone ringing to yeah, no phone was, calls. Really yeah, on the top of the game, you know. Really going to places and then got, suddenly... Yeah, sponsorship with Adidas. I got, yeah. All my sponsors just dropped me like I was, you know, it was like everything just went. Yeah. Uh, people I thought were friends weren't there and, mm. uh, and I did get very depressed mm. and very down and I think that had a massive impact. So then to come back, I needed a bit of a lift really. I needed a bit of belief from a promoter. Yeah. And it just wasn't there. Right. So as I say, from before speaking to him and, and and them talking about the big fights against Valais for the WBO and that, I was just mm. like literally that wouldn't even you know wouldn't even speak to me. Never mind anything else. Mm. So that's how I felt. Yeah, I felt yeah. isolated. I felt alone. I felt that there was no way I was going to get back. So I made the big decision to walk away from my contract. Right. Uh, and there was still, I think, there was it was an eight, about eighteen months left on it. Mm. And I walked away from it and said, look, you know, I don't want this. Yeah. I said, I'm not like some of these. Yeah. I'm actually, I've got a. I've got. I had, I had a career, mm. and I'm going to go back to it. So I actually went back to BT. Yeah, yeah. Believe it or not, did you? Uh, I actually went back capping on the went and have my job back. Yeah, yeah. Made a mistake, you know. Yeah. Forget the boxing. I've finished well, with the boxing. I'm coming back to BT. I want to. I want to work for BT. I said, yeah. I'm just going to go and get through the career ladder. Yeah. I love boxing, but I don't know all the politics yeah, that's yeah, involved yeah. in it and, yeah. and all the rest of it. So I walked away from the sport. I didn't want to know it. And then someone from the boxing news done a, a big column on me, mm. uh, and it was, "Will it ever be Wayne's world again?" Right. Literally. Uh, and in this column, it was like, you know, they said, like, you know, have you got any regrets and whatever? And I said, you know, yeah, my biggest regret is I never got to box in front of my own crowd, yeah. you know, in front of my Birmingham crowd. Mm. That's my mm. biggest regret. Yeah. Uh, but apart from that, no, I'm going to move on and, and, and it's whatever, you know, I've done what I've done and mm. it was out of my hands kind of thing. So in that gap, then we're talking, obviously, we're talking about Darren Rhodes. Mm. The phone went red hot after the boxing news got released that weekend, mm. uh, and it was literally like local promoters and stuff like, "I'll oh, see you not with Frank Warren, geez, right. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll see you want a boxing Birmingham. We can make that happen." Yes, I'm like, mate, so I'm sitting in my BT even like, you know, literally, mate, I'm not interested. Listen, you know, mm. I'm done with this boxing lark. Yeah, you know, no, we can make it. Up. You said you wanted to box in Birmingham. Come on, just. I so I thought, you know what? Come on, and I'll do one fight. So I go back to me to me gaffers of BT, and because I thought you'd finish with it all, and I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> It's one fight in Birmingham. I'm just I'm doing this fight, and that's me. I'm done. I'm yeah. finished with the sport. Yeah. But I just it'd be great to go out in front of me own mm. crowd and whatever, mm. and tick a box there. So yeah. literally, we have this fight, and so it's different now. I've left Frank, and I'm in control of my own affairs. I'm my own manager. Yeah. I'm out of contract, mm. and I'm my own manager. I would not sign, and I didn't sign mm. with anyone else again yeah. on the promotional front and whatever. I end up saying so when I went on to win the uh, other titles. Literally, I owned them titles, so to speak. Okay. Belong more to me. I didn't tie myself up to anyone again yeah. so to speak yeah. and I think that was just being scarred at the start yeah so you beat, Dar you beat Darren by KO yeah and then on to British middleweight title against Scott Dan uh, and another loss yeah uh, you know what I mean I was saying the fight against Dan was going to be the last fight I had mm. uh, so to speak I weren't intending to do it anymore yeah so I went in there and I chose Darren Rhodes as I say because we'd had this little bit of a bicker we was trying to be forced like you know you lost that fight blah blah yeah. blah and this is as I was moving up the ladder yeah 
So I said, oh, that's different now. Listen, I said, if I fought him now, I wouldn't knock him out. Yeah. So I'm a different animal now, you know. So then I was a free fight novice. I said, I, I, I fought good lads now, and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a lot, I'm a better fighter all round. Yeah. Uh, and I was, I teamed up with Paddy Lynch in that time as well. I'd actually left London mm-hmm. uh, when I left, and I teamed up with Paddy Lynch. And Paddy had got me sitting on my shots a lot more. Yeah. So I was, I was eating a lot harder. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so I chose Darren Rhodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I said to the promoter, you get me Darren Rhodes then, yeah. and I'll fight in Birmingham. Yeah. And so we done it. I remember looking. I remember we doing the, we done the. Uh, press conference leading up to it and so forth and I remember saying to Darren and that lot literally you know I was going to knock, knock him out and whatever and he was like you know I've never been knocked out before Wayne. and I like, looked at his record and I thought oh, he hasn't <laughs> <You> know, <right? laughs> well that's always the first time do you know it's yeah. one of them ones but anyway I remember going out there and I was really fired up it was at the Aston Event Centre mm. uh, I sold about 800 tickets mm. I mean you know, only hold it about 12 or 13 yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. it was all me and all you could hear around the venue before I walked out was like oh god yeah. Oh, cock, and yeah. it was like massive. I was like, no way. I remember saying to Paddy, I can't go out yet, Pad, because mm. I'll literally just start waving at everyone. I'm like, I'm here, people, I'm here. Uh, so I had to calm myself down, get me composure, uh, and literally, I remember put my hood up and just sort of put my hands on the back of my coach's shoulders and just thinking, like, oh, come on in, I've got a job to do. Yeah. Uh, and I went in there, and, and, and I think it was 70 odd seconds or whatever it was, or it wasn't long anyway, mm. a minute or so. And yeah. I got the knockout in the first round. Yeah. Uh, uh, which I was buzzing about obviously but yeah. I was disappointed being top of the bill thinking yeah. everyone's going to go mate we paid all that money for that but all the fights that night had all gone a distance so yeah, it kind of so, worked out well yeah. so we had that fight and then the British Boxing Board because Darren was so highly rated mm. uh, and I was still quite highly rated in there decided to make me mandatory for the for the British title yeah. against Scott Dan uh, it was down in Plymouth now at this time remember I'm still at BT mm. and I've not given the job up so I'm still there yeah. uh, and I'm, I'm in a dilemma now they've offered me the British title yeah yeah what do I do? So I speak to me, Gaffer, he's, no, 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 you said that was it. Yeah. I was like, oh, jeez, you know, uh, well, this is the British title. Mm-hmm. No, no. So basically, I was a team, then we'd, we'd, we'd support you, but you're not a team, you're individual. We're not a company that deals with individuals. We like to, it's a team thing. Mm-hmm. So, right, fair enough. So, not giving me the time. So, I'll then go to work. I'm training around you, thinking, oh, I can't do this. And then I'm looking at Scott Dunn's record, and he's a big puncher, yeah. knocks out near enough. You know, probably eighty percent of the guys he got in with. Mm. I remember him from back in the amateurs. He was the light middleweight champion that year. I was in the middleweight, so he was going back from from back then. Yeah, knowing all about Scott, good fight at all. Get you know, big punch on him. So we literally, uh, I'm training around my job. Mm. I, I can't do this. This this is this is. But I need this fight. I said, I'm thinking to myself while I'm at work, I can be a BT engineer at forty six. Yeah, but I can't be a boxer at that age. Yeah, so yeah, you know, yeah. literally, yeah. this is a once in a lifetime. I've got to go for it. So mm. literally, I go on the sick calling sick mm. I'm half a meal mm. I weren't I was training full time yeah. in the gym training even more and at this time I'm, I'm, I'm on fire I'm on fire in the gym I'm like wow he's going to have a real shock in this fight yeah. and uh, leading up to the fight a couple of weeks before I get a fight, phone call from one of the main bosses there sort of saying look Wayne you know, I've heard through the grapevine that you're literally training mm. for a fight you've got coming up mm. Before that, I knew I had to. The reason why I think I was so intensified and I trained so hard was because I knew they'd see me on Sky Sports in a couple of in, yeah, in a couple yeah. of in, in yeah. a few weeks' time, and I'm going to lose my job anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, it's hard to explain. No. Yeah, <laughs> you can't, you know. So yeah, so I was like, I'm going to lose my job anyway. So anyway, he rings me up and he says, like, you know, I believe you've got this fight coming up. You're training in the gym full time. He said, just be honest with me, mm. you know, late on the line. So I said, yeah, yeah, I am. I said, I am. To be honest, yeah. Uh, what do you need off? He says. Yeah. I said, well, listen, give me, give me this. Obviously, the time off now to the fight. I said, if I knock him out in the first round, I guarantee I'll be in work Monday morning. Yeah. I said, if he goes twelve rounds, give me a week off and I'll be back. Yeah. Okay then, fine. That was the worst thing that could have happened to me. Mm. The worst thing that could have happened to me because he took all the hunger away. Really? I was getting a, a decent wage for the fight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, he took that edge from the fight. Well, he stopped me. Yeah. I didn't need. I, I didn't need to win. Of course I did, bro. I knew yeah, I still had yeah, my yeah. job after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, whereas before, before it was, it was like, boring. I need this, man. I've got to, yeah, I've got to, if yeah. I don't win these fights, yeah. that's that's it. Yeah. I'm done. So literally, it was a bit of a damp affair. We we had uh, Oki Dan for doing sparring and, and, mm-hmm. and he was rushing me and pushing me and I was in, I, I was still in good shape and, I, and the, the active tactics for the game was that Scott was going to come for me mm-hmm. and I was going to counter and I was going to knock him off, off the counter. I was going to try and knock him out off the counter and, mm-hmm. you know, go with him if he wanted to go. Yeah. And we went in there literally, uh, Started fighting, he's six foot odd and lovely, you know, nice jab and whatever. Yeah. And he started off that way, you know, bullish like he was going to try and take me out. 
Uh, and I clipped him for some good shots, and mm. I think he realised literally, you know, this kid can bang a little bit. Mm. And he's quite coach, he's trying to sort of system, you know, what you he's going to knock you out. You get back on your jab, start boxing him. Yeah. So he wouldn't come to me. Yeah. And he kind of just boxed on the jab, and it was it, it was a damn. But it was the only thing about the fight was it goes down in the history as the first British title fight to be ever scored by three judges. Oh, right, okay. But that was the only good thing about yeah, the fight in some respect. Yeah, I think it was a, yeah. he didn't really perform. Mm. I didn't really perform. I didn't have a plan B. Yeah. Uh, so I go back. After the fight, disappointed, really down, I go back uh, to BT. Right. At the fight winnings, I go and buy myself a BMW from a, a galley. It's not far from here, brand new. That's yeah. make, that's that's to make me feel better. Yeah. So I buy this BM and I think, no, it's not bad. So I've got my job as well, and yeah. you know, and all the rest of it. So I've had this week. If I go back to work at BT, I'm going back in on the Monday. And as I say, for the past week, I've been driving this BM like I'm mm. Lord of the Manor. This is brilliant. This is you know, it's all worthwhile. You know, mm. don't matter. I won the British title. I've got a lovely car. Yeah. And then I'm going into work on the Monday and I think to myself, oh, I don't know what happens, I just had a finger, just, mm. what, what am I doing? Yeah. What, I'm better than this. Mm. I'm better than, I can beat him. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I went to the yard over in Four Oaks, which is not far away from here, and literally mm. parked the van up. Yeah. Went into the room and said, I'm Jackie. He yeah. went, what? He said, you Jack, no, you never come back. I said, I don't intend to. Yeah, yeah. And I actually went full-time boxing then. Yeah. And it was a massive gamble because I've got no promoter. Mm. I've got nothing at the time. And a guy called... Uh, Ken Perch, who was a local Purchase. Southwood Mr. lad, Midlands. Mr. Midlands. Did. He was, at the time, he was doing he was doing mainly uh, mainly events with, with boxers after dinner mm. speeches and all stuff. But he, yeah. he kind of had a uh, he went into the promoting thing with yeah. myself because he was over Telford, right? He Ken was, Purchase. yeah. I meant to meet Ken. Like, you know, he's a, a, a likable character. You know, and I got on well with with Ken, and mm. he made me feel like a superstar. You yeah. know, I owe Ken yeah. a lot because the way he, he sort of put me on a on a pedestal, really, which no yeah. other promoter had ever done. Yeah. You know, this shows about you, Wayne. Who yeah, do you want to yeah. fight? I went, yeah. get me Lawrence Murphy. Yeah, yeah, Let's yeah. get that to yeah. bed. Let's put See, that to bed. I, I went to because he was in Birmingham. I went to that show. Yeah. And uh, Ken Purchase, he came on in a motorbike, yes, didn't he? he with did, his hair yes, up like yes, Donkey. Donkey, that's it. And, uh, and there was Jane Couch on there. Yeah. And then you obviously headlining. Yeah. And you had avenged the loss. I it did, was, mate. It was a great night, as I remember. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it really was a, a big point in my career, that was, to be fair, because. Yeah. That was always in the back of my mind, you know, and obviously uh, a lot of people doubted. Uh, and obviously after being knocked out by someone in a round, you mm. don't really take that fight back on. And, and yeah. lot like, like, as you know, in, in the history of boxing, most of the time you get done, yeah. if not even sooner, and that's pretty impossible when you've been done in the first round. But a lot of the time, you know, they've got the, the ascendancy really, they're the ones that've got the momentum. Yeah. So it was a big fight to take, but it was one I needed to take yeah, uh, and, and to announce myself. After the Scott Dan fight, I felt that you know it was a British title eliminator as well. Mm. So it get me back on that. So I was just chasing Scott Dan. Yeah. To be yeah. fair, Murphy was just part of that path, but mm. look, Dan's my main aim, and so this would be a great fight. Get it out of the way and prove I've still got it. Yeah. And the same made that fight. I think I dropped him three times in the fight. I think he got stopped in the fifth round. Yeah, yeah. And I remember right. him coming into the change room after he was like literally, you know, fair play to you know. He said, "Geez." Yeah. You know, he couldn't believe the way I'd done it, and for me. Uh, in terms of getting revenge, it was beautiful mm, on that was, score. Yeah, but on the on yeah. the flip side to that, he never boxed again. Oh, didn't he? That was his last ever fight. So in a way, he kind of did. Did Ken Purchase do any more uh, promotions after that? Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. We'd done a few. Uh, as I say, he was a big catalyst in, mm. in, in in getting me going. As I say, yeah, a yeah. lot of it was because of the way he was with me, mm. the way he treated me, mm. uh, which I'd never been treated like that before. Yeah. You know, it was like literally yeah. he was really good. So we would sort of done the Baldassara fight, I think. Uh, yeah, after yeah. that one and then the again Bendel. with Ken. And yeah. again, he put the Bendel fight on massive mm. fight. Again, going back to the amateur days when we were kids as amateurs. Yeah. This was a way of putting that to bed. Yeah, and that um, was for the uh, the British title again. For the English title. For the English title. The oh English yeah, title, for the English title. Which was then another eliminator for the British title. Yes, yes, uh, yes. So, so I'm fighting. I'm fighting Bender through uh, the through Bendel in there. I thought I should have had the British shot earlier than that. Mm. Richard Williams jumped the queue from yeah. the light middles into there for Edward Eastman. So. Yeah. Uh, I got knocked back, and I was like, I was very, I was, I was angry. I wanted to send a statement out, really, yeah, to be fair. And, yeah. and obviously, Dan, uh, Steve was a very good fighter. Mm. I think he beat Paul Smith the fight after mine. Right. Uh, but obviously, we, I, I stopped him in eight rounds, and, mm. and yeah, I mean, literally, he, apart from the first round where he did rock me to the boots with a lovely, uh, with a lovely left cross, yeah. being a safe four, mm. and I thought I would get on the outside, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. readjust, but. Uh, apart from that, really, I literally it was a bit of a beat down in some respects, and mm. he said he just did. He, he used to say he didn't really get out of, out of first gear, really. Yeah. Whereas I just kept going through, got the stoppage in the eighth frame, which then led for me. Well, the the, the actual goal was actually Scott Dan. Yeah. He, he had a car accident, damaged his back, mm. and Howard Eastman come back and got the belt, and it was yeah. like literally, oh, no, 
I didn't come for you, mate. Yeah, I come yeah, for Scott. Yeah, now, what, yeah, just yeah. go back on the world scene, will yeah, you? You know what I mean? You're, 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 you've been, you've been, he was only beat by that time before I fought him. He'd never been beat by a Brit. Mm. Or, uh, and he'd only ever lost to, I think, Joppy, Bernard Hopkins, yeah, Ar yeah, Arthur yeah. Abrams. Yeah. No, I think it was only his four, I was his fourth defeat for him, but yeah. I was the only one that was like a British guy that to do it. So all yeah. these were world champions, you know, for world titles. Yeah. So it, it wasn't the sort of fight that I was really keen on taking. Mm. Uh, Paddy Lynch says to me, don't worry, Wayne. He said, I know him inside out, mate. He went, I used to have him down for Rob McCracken all the time sparring. Yeah. I, I, know the, I know what we can do to win this fight. Yeah. And again, it's down to having faith in your coach because mm. I didn't have faith in me. To be fair, I yeah, mean, yeah. He, was a, he was a big name. I mean, he that, was a big you know, name. he was a big, a big, a big. Uh, he was a big. It, my dad used to love watching Eric Eastman. Mm. You know, I remember mean, the mm. blonde beard when he used to yeah, come out. Yeah, yeah. I remember boxing back in the day, and like with Frank when he was up, we were both under the same pr uh, promotional banner. He's topping the bill. Mm. I'm sitting down with Frank watching the fight and stuff, and he's going, "Yeah, don't worry, son. It'll be gone by the time you get there." You yeah, know, and I'm all, yeah, thank God yeah. for that. You know, but yeah. yeah, I really respected Aaron and still do to this day. You know, he's yeah. a great, great fighter. Great name on the record. Yeah, unbelievable, right, a career best, uh, career best win for me, and still yeah. is to this day. In, in, in all fairness, you know, and uh, in, and the hardest fight as well, where you mm -hmm. had to stay on. I mean, I won over twelve rounds on points, but it was probably the hardest. I'd have to stay switched on the yeah. whole time, and the longest camp that I'd ever had leading up to it was a twelve week mm -hmm. camp. I could get ready for a fight in six, seven weeks, so yeah. I just kept myself in shape. So uh, it was a, it was a, a really, bit, but in a way, it was kind of the beginning mm -hmm. of the end. That fight was as well, mm -hmm. believe it or not, yeah. because for me. I ticked a box. You know, what I didn't mention was like from day one of my pro career, mm -hmm. I used to have a picture of Leroy Mapale wong himself in one yeah, room yeah. and a picture of my dad in the other. Right, okay. Right the way through my yeah, career. Yeah. And I'd have this little chat to him before I boxed all the time. I'd literally scoot off into the toilets and yeah. I'd have this little chat. It's my night. And, mm -hmm. you know, as you do, you're just giving yourself that little bit more inspiration and, and that mental psychology to it all. Yeah. And, and so I won the, and I think it was a bit, the, and I was like, Dad, I did it. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, yeah, I was yeah. as good as you said I was. I yeah. just beat Howard Eastman. Where, yeah. but something left me that night. Right, uh, okay. A spark left me that night. Yeah, uh, yeah. To be fair, I felt like I'd achieved what I wanted to achieve. Right. Uh, that was September, mm. uh, and the start of December. So as you can imagine, not long after just doing twelve rounds mm. and not being in the, you know, obviously tired. Yeah. Uh, couldn't go on holiday. The holiday was cancelled because now Sutherland rang me and went, half oh, right, Arthur Abrams. Yeah. And I'm like, wait. IBF, IBF, world, world title, title challenge, Switzerland, yeah. Brazil. Yeah, we need you to take it. Arthur, Ab uh, Arthur Abrams was already supposed to be fighting David Eastman on a return because mm. they had a tough fight the first time. Yeah, and so they were going to go back and do it again. Mm. Obviously, I'd rock the uppercut. You've come yeah. in, you beat Howard. Now you've took his world rating. Right you're basically you're in line. We got the mm. state of everything's booked, so mm. it's got to be done. So I'm like, wow, okay. And I said to Paddy, what do you think? And uh, he was like. You know, listen, son, you're not getting any younger. I was, you know, I said, not twilight, but you know, I was moving on a little bit. Mm. Uh, I'm gonna say, thank you for the uh, for the money, but he said, I, you know, thank you for the money and the experience, son. Right. Uh, yeah. So this is what we did, and, and and literally, I couldn't spar for that fight uh, leading up to it. And don't get me wrong, you know, oh, it was a fantastic fight. It was mm. improved, and mm. I'm not gonna say I would have beaten if he had a perfect camp. Yeah. But it, it was just like literally a, a, a rush job in some respect where. Uh, Quarter zones in my hand, my right hand, uh, yeah. quarter zones in my elbow. I used to have a lot, I used to have a golfer's elbow a lot. Yeah. Where yeah. sometimes I'd just be sparring it, yeah. just drop on me and I, I yeah. <laughs> hit me away. Go golfer's elbow's here, isn't it? Yeah, it's the other side. Tennis yeah, elbow's the tennis, there. Yeah. I've got golfer's elbow. Yeah. I've for years. And yeah. it really, it's okay when you punch him in the face. Yeah. It's when you miss, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's like a noise. Yeah, it's a common, like, just used to yeah. just drop on me. The, uh, Paddy yeah. actually got a special ice machine in the gym for me. So, right. Because if you iced it, it yeah. kind of bring it back to life for you, you can get it back. Yeah, That ends why I started driving automatic cars at one stage. Really? And actually change gears, yeah, yeah. you know, it was a lot it. easier, but yeah. So, anyway, so I went into it, not much sparring. Don't get me wrong, I was still pretty fit because I'd had the fight and I kept me training going. We'd done lots of stuff in the on cardio and all the rest of it. Mm. And the idea going in there, I mean, at this time, I, I think I'd spent a little bit of time when I had I'd been over with Marvin Agler's trainer, I spent a lot of time in the States. This was yeah. going back to the days of when I beat uh Lawrence Murphy, mm. Steve Collins was there, yeah, he put yeah. me in touch with Goody Petronelli because he'd trained me with Goody Petronelli, mm. and that so that was what 206. Mm. 205, 206, was that? Uh, for Darren? Uh, that was for the uh, Lawrence Murphy fight. Lawrence, Lawrence Murphy, Murphy fight? was um, 2006. 2006, mm. there you go, 2006. Mm. So that then my relationship started with uh, Goody Petron and yeah. where I started going to America. And so before all of them fights, yeah. I'd spend a couple of weeks in America all right. with Goody, yeah. sparring, 
working with him, doing the Hagler runs, doing mm. the Hagler training. Yeah, that, great. That was constant. Like, six years, right the way through, yeah. really, all the way through. I'd, I'd spend that time with uh, with with Goody. Mm. I couldn't do it for the Arthur Abr- Arthur Abrams fight because yeah. of the time span yeah. and the time scale with it. Uh, that was the only fight I didn't do it for. As I say, you know, preparation wasn't great. Mm. I was fit. The idea was getting there. Come on, son. Let's just give yourself a bit of credibility. Let's have a little bit of fun while we're in there. Mm-hmm. Let's get the twelve rounds out of the way. Yeah. He's quite a plodder. He's a big puncher, but I'm quick on my feet. Yeah. I don't think he can land a shot on me. Yeah. You know that was the idea going in. Mm-hmm. And I remember boxing him and, and literally going boxing away. And I'm trebling the jab up, doubling the jab up, and I'm literally in there. And I'm thinking after four rounds, I come back. At, well, he put me there in the first round, flash knocked down. Mm-hmm. All right, it weren't that bad. It was strange because I couldn't actually remember the shot. You know, right. I just remember being on the floor. The ref can't. Well, yeah, more yeah. RFS saying no problem. Yeah. How hard does this guy hit? Mm. And I think that probably put the line back. So you've all keep on your toes. And so I did. So I'm doubling, trebling the jumps. Again, not really throwing the right hand because mm. having the quarters on it, I just don't want to let it go just yet. Yeah. And again, my idea was to go through the 12 rounds. It was never to, I weren't going to try and knock him out because I knew mm. he had, you know, as you see, he went through, he fought Miranda with a broken jaw and mm. stuff. So you knew he was a tough, tough lad. Tough I weren't going to try and knock him out, but I'm going to yeah. try and at least give myself some credibility. I'm going to get the decision in, in Switzerland. Probably not. Mm. Even if I'm winning the fight, he's not, I'm probably not going to get it. You see what happened with Robin Reed and so forth, so yeah, I'm probably yeah. not going to get it. But, you know, who cares? Forget yeah. it. It don't matter. I'm just going to enjoy myself in there. So I'm doing this. So fourth round comes. Uh, he's cut. I'm in his corner at the end of the fourth round, and he's trying to go in absolutely mentally. Mm. Uh, I can't understand what he's saying because obviously mm. he's speaking mm. to him in his, his own language. So, But I know it's not good. Yeah. I can just tell by the tone of it that yeah. it's not good. Yeah. I don't know what you're messing about. You know, yeah, been, yeah. You know so... I've come back totally different, like, and I sit back in the chair and I go, Paddy, I can win this. Mm-hmm. He went, no, 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 listen, don't listen. You know what you're doing? Don't change the game plan. Yeah. Watch his right hand. I said, watch his right hand. Yeah, I ain't through my right hand yet, Pad. Mm-hmm. Just watch his right hand, son. Yeah. So anyway, I get up and I'm just, oh, I can do this easy. So I get up and I come over and I'm boxing him and I'm thinking, like, you know, just bring him onto this right hand. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I'm stood in my corner. And uh, Paddy's saying, what did I tell you about that right hand? <laughs> So what's he on about? Yeah, yeah. You know, literally, yeah. he, he he lost me a, a minute of my life, literally. Mm, yeah. You know, so so in that time, obviously, when I watched it back, obviously, he caught me for a shot, mm. totally out of it, didn't know where I was. Yeah. Referee stops me from falling, leads yeah. me back to my corner, and the next thing you know, I'm waking up, and literally, Paddy's in front of me, and I'm going, yeah. what did I tell you? And I'm like... Yeah. Um, listen to your please. trainer. I think listen to your moral. trainer. <laughs> you know, I had to deal with that after the fight, all the way I'm on the plane, and yeah. just, yeah, literally, like, wow. <laughs> but, uh, but but that but that for me uh, was the hardest puncher, mm. uh, purely because I didn't even know I'd been hit. Yeah, <laughs> and he wiped that memory away from me. So you know, uh, it would have been Howard Eastman before that. You know, obviously yeah. with, with the punch power. So yeah, the hardest fight against Eastman. Yeah, and uh, the hardest punch from punch Abraham. From, from Abrams was and, by and, far. And then you come back, Darren McDermott. So like your last couple of fights now. Yeah, know. you know what I mean. I, I, like I say, I, the, the fire for me went out on the Howard Eastman uh, fight. Mm. On the win on there, I think I'd already achieved what I wanted to do. And I, yeah. I've done me dad proud. Yeah. And that was what it was all about. Done me dad proud. And yeah, dad now people now. You know, I say I've seen people at the funeral. It's all about how good a boxer I was. Mm. Now I can literally say, you know, literally I am. I've yeah. done it. I've proved it, dad. Yeah. I hope I've made you proud. So I think that flame kind of went out mm-hmm. and it was now all about the money. Yeah, yeah. So the next few fights, so I fought McDermott and obviously, uh, to be fair, I, I, I didn't box to my full potential on the nice. It was mm-hmm. a, it was ended in the second round on a cut and it was, it was mm-hmm. a, it was a, I went out there for whatever reason. I don't know because the venue kept getting moved. It ended up being Wolverhampton at the time and, right. and I just, it was very hostile obviously for myself yeah, and got, yeah. The, the probably it was the first time probably in a long time when was I realised it was at the Civic yeah. that was a, like a bear pit wasn't it yeah, well, yeah really it, was, it was the first time in a long time uh, mm. that I'd literally not really had the, the lion's share of the crowd mm. where I felt like I was an underdog again and I'm like yeah, yeah. I'm, the cha- I'm the champion yeah. what is go- you know, what's going on here so mm. and I'm going to send I'm going to show the I'm going to you know, silence the crowd sort mm. of thing uh, Darren come out and, and, and box but I, I, I literally come out there literally trying to knock him out for whatever reason I want to really send a statement out and yeah. send the statement out early look I'm back don't worry about the Abrams thing you know this is me I'm back yeah. now uh, you've said that I think I was there that, that night as well at the Civic yeah yeah yeah. that's just come back to me yeah well I yeah. remember literally uh, a poor uh, first round with no thought about what I'm doing mm. no thought about what I'm doing coming back to Paddy and going what are you doing yeah the, I'd made my own decision consciously mm. we'd already trained and we'd already got a game plan mm. and I just 
threw that out the window. Yeah. Uh, which sometimes happens, I believe. Mm. Cal, Cal Yafo had done it the other night. He weren't mm. listening to what his trainers were saying. He, mm. he's admitted it after. It's the same sort of thing. I yeah. didn't listen to what they were saying. I thought I knew better. Yeah. I could yeah. do it. Oh, don't worry about it. Stand with this. Oh, I could do these kids, no problem. Mm. So I boxed like an idiot, really. Uh, mm. Or didn't box, to be fair. Just went out there and just tried to knock him out. Get yeah. Walked onto all because walked onto big shots. Yeah. Uh, because there was no thought in my work. Yeah. Came back. Paddy settled me down. You know, a bit of a slap around the face, really. You know, get your act together, son. Mm. Start boxing. We told you what to do. Yeah. Get behind that jab. Uh, don't rush in, uh, and which I believe I started to do in that in that next round. Mm. Uh, but then, obviously, fortunately, clash of heads. Yeah. Cut his eye, and the, the fight obviously got stopped on the cut. And I retained my title, not in the best way. I remember mm. we're in the ring, and the sky like saying to me, like literally, Wayne, do not celebrate, mate, please. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, literally, yeah. it was very hostile at the time. There was already yeah. bloody cups coming into the ring and whatever else, and <laughs> security ushering <laughs> me out and still not wave, geez, yeah. yeah. But but not celebrate this one, and out I went straight away. So. We've done that one, and I'll be honest with you, I think after the Abrams fight, I was kind of ready to go. Mm. But I think the, because uh, now, I'll tell you what the worst thing is. I'll say this to fighters, and I'll say this to fighters out there. I believe for me that if, when you start fighting for money and not passion, get out. Mm. When you start fighting for money, not passion, get out. Yeah. Because for me, money was always a bonus, yeah. never the necessity. Yeah. So the first fight I had with Frank, when he rang me and he told me about the money, mm. I was literally putting the phone in because I need you back in London, we got the fight with Fine Al, blah, blah, and I was like, I'm not even bothered about the money, I'm just going, you're great, I'm back in London, yeah, no yeah. problem. And he's putting the phone in, he's going, oh, don't you want to know what you're getting paid? And I was like, mm. I don't really care. Yeah, yeah. I want the title. Yeah. When you start trading titles in for money, mm. that's when it goes down. So that, so I've traded that in, I've sold yeah. my soul mm. for the Abrams fight for me. Yeah. I've sold my soul, mm. I've done it for the money. Yeah. Uh, again, next fight, done mm. it for the money. Mm. You know, and, 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 and again, on the, on the, so the last fight, so we get the throw of the dice now, obviously. Uh, we've got Macklin made as mandatory. Mm. Me, like, at the time, Sky Sports had lost, uh, or Hennessy had pulled away from Sky Sports, mm. and ITV were coming in, but yeah. we didn't know when. I run a, a local football team at the time. Uh, I used to do a lot of stuff in the local community. The area didn't ever have any football teams. Uh, it was quite a poor area, so for me, I, a deprived area. I wanted to bring that back in, even mm. though I was a boxer, so mm. I started up uh, some kids' football teams, and actually run the adults team. Mm. A lot of young lads that I used to have playing for me and literally be playing against the team, and uh, there was no game for a while anyway. I'm managing, I used to manage them as I say, mm. uh, and I used to play for the Birmingham City former players, which I still do today, yeah, in charity games around it. But it was only the odd game here and there. So, anyway, we're playing this game, we're getting the, my lads are getting butchered, yeah. Uh, it was a load of men against boys, really. Mm. A lot of kids in my team were only probably about 18, 19 at the time, young kids, but fit. I used to have in the boxing gym every week as part of their mm. football training, so full of vibrance running. Yeah. You know, fit team. So anyway, they're playing. They're getting hammered all over the place, and I'm like ref and the referee. You know, they used to score with Sunday football. The refs, yeah. one of their pals or whatever. You yeah. know, they're going play on, play on. I'm like play on. You're having a laugh. He's doing. <laughs> you just took him up in the air tempo. He's like play on. Yeah. So anyway, so we carry on, uh, uh, and I, at this meantime, I'm like, I always used to have a kit on, even though I weren't intentionally going to go on. Yeah. But it was just in case. Sometimes it just got to shore it up. Really, to mm. be fair, just sit in the centre. Even though I was a forward, yeah. I'd go in and sit in centre, centre mid or something, just to calm the lads down and see a game out. Sometimes and that nothing yeah. major. I wasn't going to get myself involved, or if it needed, be a little bit of an enforcer on the team for, mm. for our team as uh, with young lads. Yeah. So anyway, there I am. I've got these kids on. Always had my shorts on. Obviously sitting on the side of the side. I thought, forget these up. Rip me top off, and it was the worst thing I could have done, mate. Mm. So I go on the pitch. And I'm on the pitch about because I've a few more bad tackles and I thought I'm bad enough. Ref, yeah. so bring yeah. myself on. Yeah. And I come on and I'm on the park and I'm probably on the park no more than 10 minutes. And again, some really dirty challenges going in. I'm thinking, ref, and he goes, play, I'm playing. I thought, mm. right, I'm taking him and yeah. I'm taking the ball. Mm. So I run over to this kid and I go, just, I'm just going to take him with the ball, forget it. Yeah. I, I, I lash out at him, obviously. He turns around here in the referee. I was actually blown up because my kid's on the floor, really. Mm. Uh, he turns around to kick the ball out. Mm. And it was my foot was off the ground. Okay. Uh, he was like a toe poke, basically. I yeah. broke my own leg. Oh, shit. I broke my own leg. So anyway, I kick him and literally I'm like, feel the snap. And I thought, oh, that, yeah. that hurt. Went down. I thought, that hurt. Mm. So I'm thinking, God, I'm going to have to go to the hospital. So they, they took me to the hospital after the game and the, the hospital said, like, you're lucky. Mm. It's not broke. Mm. It's badly bruised, I think. So you're just going to have to rest it. Mm. They give me some crutches. Actually went and picked up the award for the best boxer in the Midlands that year for mm. beating Howard Eastman on yeah. crutches. Yeah. Uh, say not long before the before the fight. So anyway, so I'm on crutches now. So I says to Paddy, it's all right, you know, the med mandatory, uh, Macklin mandatory. Mm. So I said, fair enough, not a problem. So we go back in the gym. I'm on crutches, say, ugly. So Paddy, don't worry about it. We'll go around other stuff. It's not broke, not a problem. Yeah. Upper body, son. 
uh, the rowing machine. I was rowing like an Olympic rower. Mm -hmm. You know, the fitness levels were there. It was good on that score. Yeah. Uh, the stepping machine couldn't run from here to the door. You know, okay. couldn't run ten meters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and literally, Paddy's kind of like he's now saying, "I'm a bit worried about this now because mm. I'm on the stepping machine, the one down. There's literally tears rolling down my yeah, cheeks, yeah. and he's giving yeah. these looks." This doesn't look right. You're mm -hmm. going to go to. He took me over. It was I mean, Booper or Spires over in Sully. It was private healthcare. He said, "You're going through my people. I'm yeah. going to get you down there. Let's get a proper mm -hmm. MRI on this. I'm not happy about yeah. it. Are you looking too much pain?" Because I said to him, "Don't worry, Paddy. I'm a machine, not a man." Yeah, yeah. I had that mentality that yeah. I just keep going. So I'm carrying on training through it all. We go down to Spires. You do the MRI, uh, and I get the bad news. Literally, they come back out. They went like, "Not only have you broke your tibia, you've broke your fibia." Oh you probably God. had a hairline that weren't picked yeah, up. You've yeah, now because you've yeah. trained on it. Yeah. You've trained on it. You've walked on it without yeah. any proper support. You've busted both bases. You've got a tibia and fibula break here. Mm. Worst news is Wayne. It's been a couple of weeks. No point putting you in cast. You wow. just got to let nature take its really? course. So you're just going to carry on the, the uh, finger. Yeah. So this time, what you do? They'll pull out the fight. Well, it was 2009. Mm. Uh, I'd lost all my sponsors. You say I'd lost a few before, but I'd gained a few back since the run with Ken Purchase and whatever. Yeah. And getting yeah. yourself back up the ladder. Uh, literally lost all my sponsors. Mm. Uh, the economy crashed. Guys coming in saying, oh, "I'm being funny, Wayne. You know, in, you know. Obviously, I can't afford to carry on sponsoring you now. Mm. The, the, the company's gone down from about 300 people to about 20. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's it, we just got. It's about surviving now. Mm. So yeah, uh, no sponsor. The only way I'm going to get any money now is actually from the fight. Yeah. So I had to make a, a the decision. Was I going to get in there, mm. knowing full well that I wasn't really at my best? Yeah. But I need the money. Yeah. Uh, or do I pull the fight mm -hmm. can I afford to pull the fight how long will I have to wait to fight again Yeah. Uh, this is probably going to be the last chance I'll get uh, it's an all Birmingham affair it's going to be a big money fight and it was a big money fight because mm -hmm. we were both from Brum mm -hmm. it's massive uh, I'm going to chance this Yeah. I think I can do this so I try and change my style in training mm -hmm. so in the sparring that we had down we had Danny McIntosh down here obviously went on to win the Europe we had him down and uh, it was all about me just going forward yeah. against big lumps as well, you know, yeah, literally yeah. that could push me back. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I felt confident going into it, even though I was still trying on this broken leg, so to be yeah, which yeah. was mended. But I was still trying on this broken leg. But yeah, so I'll go through it. Uh, the only thing I couldn't do is run. Mm. I could kind of start walking on it, but I couldn't run. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so the style had completely changed. And I'm mm. feeling quite comfortable in this style. Mm. And I remember a guy coming down, he was a big boxing fan. From over these, he used to come down. Can I come down and watch your spar? Mate, of course you can, mate. No problem. Mm. What's up with your leg? He said, I said, ah, My leg's fine, mate. No problem. He says, What is Matt will think that I'm going to come out? Oh, we've sparred in the past. He'll think that I'm usually on the back foot and I'm a counter. He'll think that, but I'm going to change his quality around. I'm going to take it to him, basically. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, the, uh, that was the idea of the game was to, to take it to him. Uh, comes to fight night. I remember the morning of the way, actually, to be fair, I mean, Missy's been very worried about my my safety if you like because I'm not mm. I'm in a lot of pain there because yeah. for the first time in my career I had to make weight without running okay I couldn't run yeah, yeah, yeah. so it was literally I was sitting in stoners I was just trying anything I could that I wasn't eating mm. and I, I always I used, to, I used to put a sweatsuit on so I could have a bit of food on the night and stuff yeah. you know I used to always eat right the way up to the fight mm. you know so I was never really famished uh, but it's the first time I've actually had to do it the wrong way yeah. the way I'd say mm. never for a fight and never to do it mm. to not eat live on ice cubes and stuff mm. like that just give myself water yeah so obviously with that, I'm not putting the right nutrients in my body. So I'm in a lot of pain mm -hmm. uh, on the day of the weigh-in. And the missus like, what's the matter with you? And I'm like, my leg was killing me, it was throbbing. Mm -hmm. And it was just because I was taking all the nutrients away yeah, from the body, yeah. obviously, which yeah. it needed. So anyway, we do the weigh-in, we get there at the weigh-in. Again, I kept my mouth shut in the weigh-in. And, you know, literally, he was mouthing all, yeah, he's never seen anyone like me. I'm going to do this and I've just kept me away. It was hard because I knew mm -hmm. I weren't really getting in there right. So yeah. I just keep my mouth shut and just be like, you know, just, just do the job, you know, I feel I've got the... But I weren't never going to... It killed me because he was being... At that time, I felt and you've got to do that because you've got to bubble yourself up. Yeah. very disrespectful mm. and I really wanted to fire back to it yeah, but yeah, I couldn't yeah. because I was like I've broken pretty leg here you know so <laughs> but anyway yeah. I've still convinced myself in my mind that I can still win this fight even yeah. with a broken leg yeah. and this will be even bigger when I tell people mm. after mm. And, and when so the, uh, only a week before the fight they had the, um, they, they sent me the boxing board sent me a message you've got to go and have an MRI on your leg because you pulled out your last fight obviously or then that, that's when you should have had for a broken leg so we need yeah. to know that it's alright mm. so I went to this guy over in Knoll done an MRI he come back, we sit down on the thing. I've still got the MRI prints with the mm. brakes still cleanly on it. Oh, right, okay. Which you'll see in my autobiography, which yeah, we're yeah. going to release down the line. Oh, uh, excellent. I kept, the, I kept the, the prints, basically. But mm. yeah, anyway, so he says, you should be running in the next two or three weeks. He said, it's healing nicely. I went, mate, you say that, and I'm out of these fights. I've paid you, I know he's free, mm. I've quit for the things and that. Yeah. I'm telling you I'm fine. I'm yeah. skipping, I'm running, I'm doing everything. Yeah. I don't care what them prints are saying. Mm. I'm telling you I'm fine. Yeah. You say this not, I, I ain't going to be able to box. Mm -hmm. 
So literally, his report was literally I was fit enough to, yeah, to box, yeah. so to speak, right. and, and that's what I went on to do. And then, obviously, subsequently, remember getting on the night of the fight. I remember him coming past the ITV saying, "Are you ready, Wayne?" As I do it, he's come past the door, and he looked charged, mm. no doubt about it. And, I, I, and then all of a sudden, that confidence that I had was what? Yeah, I thought yeah. he's he's yeah. here to do the business. Yeah. He's you know fair play to him. He's here to do the business. But like, I've turned around to Paddy. I went, Pad, I ain't done my running. Mm. He went, don't give me all that now, we've done this, we've done this. I said, yeah. oh, no, no, but I need to do me running, you know, and mm. I'm like, this ain't gonna, this is gonna be a bad night. Yeah. I could sense it then, you know, and he said, I'm not gonna be able to get over this now, I think this is gonna be a bad night. And I remember mm. getting in there and thinking like, oh, it's all right. I used to love the blue corner for whatever reason, yeah. coming out of the blue corner, even yeah. though that's usually the away fighter, so to speak, because at Frank's it was always a blue corner. Mm. So anyway, I remember going in there and going into the blue corner and going, oh, great, wicked. Mm. And then I would say coming over and going, Wayne, you're in the wrong corner, mate. You're in the red. Right, okay. And then you start thinking, this is going to be. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. This is, everything's going wrong. Because that was kind of like giving me a bit of a, a, a beast. And I remember going in there and I boxing the first round. And for whatever reason, as I say, all my sparring was going forward and uh, and, and, and bullying him, mm. bullying him really. And he was coming up from like middle, so I thought I could have that, that extra strength would be with me. Yeah. I got in there for some reason and started boxing like I used to box. Yeah. On the back foot, looking for counters and all the rest of it, and then mm. realising at the end of the first round, I pad my legs, bloody kill him. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, I can't be bouncing around like that for the rest of the fight, and so I kind of do that for a couple of rounds, and I think then I'm thinking, I'm just going to have to stand and take it. Mm. I said, I'll tell you what, like literally in my head, I'm thinking to myself, just land a decent shot, mm. and I'll go, mate. Just give me my paycheck, and I'll come back another day, and we'll put this right, yeah, yeah. so to speak. Because as an amateur pro, you never, I never lost to anyone twice, mm. and that was always in my head that I could always come back and avenge it, which yeah. I'd already done in the past, or yeah. I've always done in the past. So literally, I'm in there, and I remember getting caught with a shot, uh, and thinking, right, this is it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Seeing it coming, this is it, like, boom. And I went, oh, I'm still here. Right. Bang again, and I am still here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm still here. Come on, you got, you know, don't hit me hard enough to put me down. But I remember mm -hmm. thinking at the time, if only my, my leg weren't broken, just really disappointed in myself. And I felt mm -hmm. that I'd frauded everyone I told to come to the fight and, mm -hmm. and win the I was always a fan's person. I loved yeah, the people yeah. who come to support me. And yeah. I really thought I'd done them out of it. You know? So I had to battle mm -hmm. a lot of demons yeah, yeah. after yeah, that I, fight. I understand that. Uh, and then Mick wanted me to obviously explain after mm -hmm. that I got a broken leg mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. But then I just didn't feel that was right. And no. I'm still not going to take that shine away from Matt. No, and no. thankfully he went on to do, do yeah. well and he fought Sturm. And, 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 and a cracking fight, you know, but... Mm -hmm. In my art of arts, I felt that if it was a me that going against David Eastman, that I wouldn't have had a problem. Yeah. But that's another yeah. story. You yeah. just got to let these things go. But uh, but yeah, I wasn't anywhere near at my best. And we had the same kind of fan base as well, both yeah. Birmingham City supporters. Mm -hmm. A lot of our fans were crossed between the two. So as I was hobbling around on crutches, I'm sure he might have knew a slight way that what was going on anyway. But yeah. you know, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. But that was your last fight? Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then after after boxing, after that fabulous career, which started and stopped and started and stopped, yeah, and obviously you, you reached some great heights. Yeah, yeah. Considering and what age was you at this point when you when you finished? Well, it would have been about thirty-five. Thirty-five, 35. and then and then after boxing. Well, there, there wasn't really at the time. I I, I sort of like, I said I was ready to go. Mm. I thought, you know, I don't worry about it. you. Got that? You just move on from it, and then. It, the demons just set away at me mm -hmm. that I'd let people down. I always yeah. felt like I'd frauded people who mm -hmm. were coming to the fight expecting me to turn up, and I didn't. Yeah. Uh, so then I was going to come back. So I said to Hennessy and that, you know, I need a, I need to get back in there, sort of thing, and uh, I need to fight Darren Barker. Uh, this time, Matt Macklin had given the belts up mm -hmm. and moved on to well levels and so forth, European title and so forth. So. He'd give it up, so literally, Darren Barker was there. Uh, he just got the British and Commo uh, British title, I think. I think the or the Commonwealth title. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he got the Commonwealth title because when I beat Howard Eastman, it was supposed to be for the British and Commonwealth. Yeah. And I forgoed that to fight for the IBF. Right. Okay. And so it stayed in camp. Yes. So then obviously Barker took the Commonwealth vacant. So yeah. the British was now vacant because Macklin had give it up. Mm -hmm. They made me mandatory for that. I had yeah. to go to the board to force that fight. Okay. We got it forced. We mm -hmm. got it made. British and Commonwealth this time. Yeah. Get them both together against Barker. And I was on fire. Mm. I really felt the obviously the yeah, leg weren't. Yeah. I was I was in great nick. Yeah. Uh, feeling really good. And I probably overtrained. Probably took a lot out of my body. Yeah. Uh, and, and I came down with an illness, as you do sometimes when you get to that level of fitness when mm. there's no immune system. Yeah. Uh, and I went right down to eleven stone. Right. Okay. Uh, had to go to the obviously to the, to the uh, doctor then to get weighed and, and get a verification to send to the boxing board. Mm. And then I tried to get the belt put back because yeah. we both were the same promoter. Uh, and literally Mick was like no I can't do that way it's, mm. it's done now we'll have to put someone else in it's too close to the fight it was only about a week and a half away from the fight yeah. we can't put someone else in yeah. uh, so Danny Butler I believe stepped in mm. in my place only a week's notice or whatever he got stopped but 
I was then in limbo. I rang back the board, spoke to the guys there, Charlie and stuff, and it literally mm. like, what's going on? Well, you just have to build your way back up again. Mm. Well, it took me 18 months to get to Howard Eastman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which was going to be obviously got done originally, but is it going to be the same? I haven't got that time at this point in my career. I've got that time, so again, I'm going in a bit of a slide. I'm yeah. still in the gym training, uh, but there's no real sort of end goal. Mm. And also, have I got the real drive really to? I was, I'm doing this for the fans. I'm not mm. actually doing this for me. I'm doing it because I've disappointed you. Like, and I yeah, want to yeah. get that back. Yeah. So it wasn't really... So it's really hard when you there's that drive's not properly for yourself as mm. such and you've got no real sort of course. But as I say, you know, uh, I was in a bit of limbo, still training, but no real plan. Yeah. Uh, someone approached me from the local council uh, and asked me if I'd work with some naughty lads. Mm. Or naughty, you know, naughty boys and girls, if you like, in the area. Because you're from the area. Mm. You could inspire them and so forth. And... I said, yeah, I'll give it a go. Yeah, why not? Mm. I'd got my pro trainer's license. I'd already got that before I finished because I was going to go kind of in the pro route, I think, down the line and, and sort of join up with Paddy yeah. and go in his camp. But So anyway, so I said, I can't really do it with that. So I had to go and do a box exercise course, believe it or not, to get over the red tape yeah. so I could work with kids, got the DBS and yeah. sort of like started. Work. So we're just about to start now. I've mm. got this new sort of goal. I'm like, this is, well, I can't box forever, can I? Mm. At least I can coach for it on more, uh, longer, mm. but I can't box forever. So I went down that sort of path. Uh, just before it was all starting, the lady unfortunately got moved on. You know, yeah. she did reshuffles in councils and so forth. So she got moved on, and the new guys that come in were like, "Wayne, you know, I ain't being funny, but you know, we could get someone, we could get free coaches for what we're trying to pay you. And we yeah. just can't justify that." Mm -hmm. um, I like she said to him, "You know, just give me an opportunity. You know, I want to work with these kids. I want to give them a chance. I like, I can inspire them. I can help them. Mm -hmm. uh, just give me a chance." Yeah. Uh, don't have to sign a contract, you know. If you don't know what I'm doing, just send me, send me on my way. Mm. So thankfully they, they did. But they said, "Well, we're going to send you the worst kid we've got." Basically, you know, this kid doesn't stay on the sessions. He's a nightmare to work with. Mm. Uh, he's just been excluded from school. He's trouble with the police. You know, you, you know, go on forever. Yeah. Uh, if you can do miracles with this kid, then you're worth that money. Yeah, yeah. You know? So yeah. anyway, they sent this kid to me, and literally, uh, it was a nightmare, mate. He turned up in his school uniform with his mum, and he was like, literally, like. As an 11 year old kid sort of saying mm. to me like literally i don't really care who you are mate mm. you know i don't want to do this i'm only here because she's dragged me yeah, you know, it's yeah. Hard, oh this is going to be great isn't it? yeah so you don't actually want to do it. no no so sit there then let me show you what you could be doing mm. so i'll get the skipping rope show him a few strips on the skipping rope and whatever do you like that yeah. yeah i couldn't learn you how to do that mm. no no i'm not interested so i get the gloves on work the bag and show him a few little tricks on the bag do you like that? yeah yeah i'll just show you that no i'm not interested so Eventually, I managed to get him also. There was a guy with him, and I said to him, you know, just can you stand up with him, please? So he's mm. not on his own. Mm. Got him to stand up with you. He left under a right-handed guy. He said, I'm, I'm left-handed. You're what you call a safe four, great. And the other guy was an orthodox. So he swear I wanted to stand, you know, mm. right leg forward. And all that, you get through all the drills and stuff. And then I said, I'll tell you what we do. So I've shown him some of the, these are the basic punches. I'm only teaching him a few of them. I'm not going to start yeah. going to uppercuts and hawks. Mm. I'm just going to teach him the basic straight shots yeah. and moving forwards and backwards and that's it like, we're in there at a time there remember because mm. he's wasted after the session while he's just watched me yeah. knackering myself out on the bag and skipping yeah, yeah. so anyway I said oh, you look like you've got somewhere about you mm. and I'm watching you mm. and at the time I wasn't actually saying it I've always been deadly honest mm. you know yeah. so you look like you've got something about you so yeah. literally I've put the pads on let me just see what you like son. so I took yeah. him on the pads for a little bit mm. and I could see I'm kind of getting into this kid he's kind of enjoying it a little bit he's still in his school uniform but he's kind of enjoying it yeah and I said, look, you know, hopefully, you know, I'll see you next week. Mm. Yeah, yeah, whatever, I kind of thing. And off he goes. And anyway, it was only once a week I was doing it at the start. It was on a Monday. And he, he come back on the Monday. The following Monday, I turned up thinking, I hope he's here. Yeah. And lo and behold, there he was. Mm. You know, literally all kitted out this time, yeah, ready yeah. to start work. Yeah, can yeah. I help you, Mr. Rock? Can I help you, oh, the gear, okay. and all the rest of it? And, yeah. Uh, and that kid was Elliot Hurley. And you all mm. have heard of Elliot Hurley because he's just turned professional with me as a boss yeah, for Cronk Birmingham. Yeah, that's amazing. Tender age of 21. So yeah, yeah. I've had him for 10 years. That's so. what boxing can do for but, people. But, yeah. but that's pretty much Changes what it was. So, so I'm literally now, am I going to come back for a fight? Mm. I'm training this kid. Mm. Uh, and now this kid's like eating porridge before he goes to school. He's going for a run. Yeah. I had this little program I'd built up. He was like the Mad Dog Diary. And how I used to train. I used to be in the yeah. gym six and a half hours a day, mm. three sessions a day, you know, and the yeah. diet I had. And it, I was trying to feed that into him. Yeah. And now he's trying to live that life. Mm. so his mum's like what are you doing you know, and now and, and, and I'm saying to you, you know, you need your education go to school I know mm. his teachers where he went to a, a school after for kids with a school they'd ring me up at school can you have a word with him and I go don't mess about now so yeah, you're yeah, boxing yeah. later and stuff yeah. like that you know and, and, yeah. and sort of kept him in check mm. uh, but told him you know so thankfully he got back into school again mm. and, and finished school and, and ended up you know going rather than really wagging him most of the time yeah. and so forth. you know like little things like that really and just teaching the, 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 the benefits of boxing so I'm mm. sitting there thinking I oh, was that kid at school 
that was an absolute nightmare yeah. that got an award when I left for you know the the survival award mm -hmm. for the person that was most likely to be excluded but yeah. survived and improved beyond recognition through boxing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm speaking to the council now and I'm thinking I'm absolutely loving this. I'm training mm -hmm. myself and I'm mm -hmm. working away and I'm going. What can I do to make it different for Elliot tonight? Yeah, I need to get out this sport. Yeah, so I retired myself rather than the sport retired me. Yeah, because I realised that my goal was no longer on me. And and I'll be honest with what we've done in terms of working with the kids and that. Mm. I've gotten far more joy out of that than I ever did out of winning any title. Really, and that's the gospel truth. Yeah, and this is why yeah, yeah. having yeah. this goal now. Of, Having these guys who were both my amateur boxers turned professional, both mm -hmm. kids I've had from babies, and yeah. following them now on their professional journey, yeah, oh, yeah. they give me more of a buzz than I ever had myself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I've always ever done. I've done it for my dad when I was a pro. Mm. Uh, when I tried to come back, I was doing it for the fans. I don't think I've yeah. ever done it for me. Uh, I think I enjoy giving back to others, mm. and I think that's why we do so well in the shop as yeah, well. Because it's yeah. not about. Um, it's never about me. Yeah, and it reflects in the shop as well because it's not. Um, it's it's about sort of getting the best kit for the person that comes into the shop. Yeah. Uh, and with all your experience and everything, you can you can make sure that that person, you know, does get that correct. Uh, kit. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's levels, and I'm not going to send the kid out in a pair mm. of hyper KOs who's only just who's only just been boxing for two or three weeks. Yeah, yeah. You know, or, yeah. or a pair of Cleto Reyes. Yeah. As much as I love Cleto Reyes, mm. as much as they can probably afford it, it's not about yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, see the brands like this. You need to earn. Mm. You need to earn. Give yeah. the kids something to earn. You know, mm. and that, this is what I put across to the kids. You know, uh, we're in a world where literally things are given far too easy. Yeah. With boxing, we can kind of we can kind of replace that, mm. and we can give them that self respect, self discipline, self esteem. We can yeah. give them all these things. Yeah. Uh, it was that journey with that kid there that literally led me to start up a company called Box Clever, which is still mm. going strong today. Yeah. Uh, and run sessions across the entire Midlands, which mm. was a. Uh, Led to a, a WBC Ambassador Award and an award from the British Boxing Board of Control yeah, yeah. for 100% crime reductions in areas. Yeah. So I've got like two mobile rings that go out mm. and we set it up and we try and get the kids off the streets and, and learning the noble art of boxing. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's called Box Clever because that's what boxing is all about. It's about hitting and not getting hit back. It was the principles of the sport, yeah. uh, but also giving them the values uh, mm. of having a healthier a lifestyle. But I believe. I wasn't trying to find. I always said like the it, the, the the slogan on my van says, mm. uh, "Designed by a champion to create champions," yeah. which is slightly misleading mm. because for me, I always say it's not just about creating champions in boxing; mm. it's champions in life. Yeah, because yeah. I believe it's that yeah. grounding that I had as a boxer and being used to being number one and all the mm. rest of it that led me to be very successful in business. Yeah. Even though, unfortunately, I left school with little qualifications that shouldn't mm. have led me to where I went. Yeah. I think it was the boxing that literally gave me that drive. I want to be number one. Listen, mm. I always say, I said now when I started the, the Mad Dogs Boxing Store, yeah. we're the number one store in Birmingham. Yeah. Then it goes to we're the number one yeah, store yeah. in the Midlands. Yeah. I want to be number one store in the UK. And it's yeah. just, the draw, I can't help that. Whatever mm. I do, it, I kind of, you know, uh, always, I want to be I want to be number one. It gives yeah. you that winning mentality. Yeah. So, so when do you open the shop? It was actually owned by, I say by accident, so mm. to speak. It was opened about seven years ago, not here. Yeah. It was opened in a little market store mm. because we train a lot of children over the Midlands and they're all asking me for equipment. Now, yeah, yeah. I train in my boxing gear. Mm. So the same boots are retired in. The Adidas boots are retired in. I'm yeah. wearing the gym now. Like, yeah. So when I'm coaching someone, I like to have boots on because I like to be able to show them and explain mm. footwork and so forth. And so I'm wearing all that gear. So the kids yeah. are coming to me, where'd you get the boots from? Where'd you yeah, get this one? Yeah. So I'm sort of sending them on to different places. Mm. But they're coming back with the wrong kind of gear. Yeah. So even down to your boots, mm. there's a particular boot that will suit a certain kind of fighter. Mm. And then there's novice fighters that should have a certain boot. And you know, so even down to that, when people never really look at that. Yeah. Uh, so you only got, you've only got, to, and I always then use my examples as in like, if you look at Rocky Marciana and Mike Tyson with a typical ankle boot, mm. they weren't really, you wouldn't really say they were flying around the ring. No. You know, they'd march someone down. Yeah. Someone like Ali, Leonard, people like that had higher boots on because mm. they needed more support yeah. on that calf and around the ankle area. And if mm. you remove it, you'll need a higher boot. Yeah. Uh, we've got boots there that are slightly mid-range. Mm. And I'd say the mid-range boots is are really good for when you're kind of starting out and you don't know where you're going to be. Am I going to be a plotter? Am I going to be someone yeah, who moves yeah. around the ring? So yeah. it gives them, so I can give them that advice, not only on the, on the gloves and stuff, but also on the boots, which yeah. I think hasn't really been highlighted by any stores mm. in the past. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you get the wrong boot and you can cause yourself more damage than, than mm. good, so to speak. Yeah. So yeah. a mover coming to me, so they're starting in these boots, any mm. boots, because they're cheap. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, these will do you. So you just start, you go on and you can have these. Mm. So they're selling these boots and they're getting to the gym and I'm like, they're ankle boots. 
you're moving around the ring like Muhammad mm. Ali. Mm. You're not getting the support on your car. Yeah. No wonder your car's hurting. You're not getting the support on your car. You know, yeah. not that sort yeah. of thing. So that was kind of what led me into, uh, it was by accident in some respects. So mm. in the end, disappointed at what was out there mm. and what the kids were coming back in the gym with, mm. I kind of said to the to the parents, I started saying, like, listen, we want to get him some gloves. We want to get him a, come here, let's have a look. And we go yeah. on to, I'm not going to obviously give him a compet- competitor's yeah. a plug now, yeah. obviously. Yeah. But anyway, so I'd go on to certain websites and yeah. so on and go, these are the boots you need. Mm. Look, they're £50, pound, mm. 550 postage or whatever, or £5 pound postage, £6 pound postage. Yeah. Uh, give me £56 pound mm. and I'll get them in for you. Yeah. So I ended up like, literally just buying off these yeah, other websites. Yeah. And I'm coming yeah. to them, I'm coming, you know, on a Monday or Tuesday, I'm walking up to the gym and I've got like four pairs of gloves, mm. five pairs of boots, but I'm buying them all off websites. Yeah. I'm like, this is crazy, this is, you know, yeah. just because I know the gear they should be having. So mm. we kind of started off with the shop that was in the gym. Mm. If you've ever seen any old pictures of it, it actually mm. was in a little corner of the gym to start with. Yeah. That started taking off. Uh, but we used to have problems with other gyms. Mm. I felt, uh, this is what I sensed. Because yeah. they like, literally the shop was in the corner. Yeah. And so like when they come into the gym, they're like, oh, they wouldn't like look around the gym. It was like they were like being a traitor to their to their own gym, so to speak, yeah. like, I shouldn't really be in here, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And like, the shop's over there, mate, and they go over and like, they bite, and they'll be like, straight up, oh, thanks, Wayne, and yeah, out yeah, there, yeah. and I thought, yeah. it's not a good idea having it here. So mm-hmm. we actually, we moved it into a market, but then it needed, obviously, uh, people in there. Mm-hmm. At the time, we boxed Clever doing so well, we yeah. had stuff running in the morning, stuff running in the afternoons. What we started to do was we built them a rotor up, mm-hmm. where literally going, right, then on the morning, you're coaching at this school and that school, yeah. on the afternoon, you're in the shop. Yeah. You're coaching on the morning, you know, vice mm-hmm. versa. Mm-hmm. So we had like two coaches in there on the morning, two coaches in on the afternoon. Yeah. That's how the rotor kind of worked. Because I thought the best people to actually buy stuff of these coaches, people are out there, they were all boxing because mm. if you coach for me, you had to box for me. Yeah. If you was of that age, kids mm. that had come through the program, so it was now giving them a job with yeah, Box Clever, yeah. Yeah. but also continuing their education with the boxing as well. Mm. So that went well uh, until probably about five years ago because mm. we've been here what four and a, four and a bit years, yeah. yeah. So about four years ago, we had one guy, one of my coaches was away on a holiday. The mm. other coach got a job at Lam Rover and right. was like, literally, I can't do the shop on Wednesday. Wayne, I've got a new job. I'm leaving. I'm going to Lam Rover. I'm like, okay, yeah. fair enough. That would have left me in a lot of problems, obviously. So I went back to the missus and I said, I want to cover the shop Wednesday. Mm. I mean, just, well, you're going to have to work it yourself. Shut up. I'm mm. not working in the shop. Yeah. No way. Yeah. No way. Yeah, yeah. You're going to have to. What are you going to do? You're going to have to keep it closed. And I'm one of these people. I'm not going to let this beat me. So literally, <laughs> I, I decided to go in the shop and work in the shop. Yes. Literally, uh, people coming from all over the place when I was in the shop, advertising mm. on the I'm in the shop now and what have you. Literally tripled the income of the shop. Mm. Uh, uh, and then started looking at the products that we do, and going, well, you know, that's rubbish. I wouldn't wear that. Why are we even selling that? Because yeah. I wasn't selling it. I wasn't bothered. Yeah. And I said, I'm not being funny, but I can't stay here mm. uh, in this market store. We aren't bigger, and this is where we're at this stage. Here. If we'll be here in another two years, who knows? Mm. It's getting bigger and bigger. Where we uh, already getting to the stage where we kind of outgrow in this store now, but yeah. and we'll have to probably move to a bigger one. But yeah, as I say, we moved here, and when I came here, it was in the intention that literally, if I wouldn't wear it then mm. I wouldn't sell it. Yeah, yeah. And that, that was why I started the channel in the first place, exactly the same reasons that people were coming into the gym and they were spending money on things that wasn't very good. And I was I was sort of, it used to like get me in the heart. Yeah. I was like, why have you done that? You, you could have just asked me. Yeah. I started doing the channel for exactly the same reasons yeah. as you've started to do the shop. And, you know, and I, I do the channel the same way as you do. It, it's about honesty and integrity and, and getting the best equipment for the people out there it's not about you it's not yeah. about me it's about it's about you guys out there yeah we um and, I, and I've, I've sensed that when i when i spoke to you on the phone first of all and when i came to the shop last week um and i in the video that i did about the uh, the custom clatter i sort of said you know come to the shop and have the experience yeah and it is a bit like that contender shop when yeah. i used to go in and it's it's not only buying the gear it is having a chat with boxing people yeah, and went, people yeah. around same and as I, I went there right the way through the yeah. amateurs right the way through the pros and that again like it doesn't matter what level you're at whether you're just starting out whether you're yeah. just doing keep fit I will give you the right advice mm. if I don't think I can kick you out I actually sent a guy out the other day yeah. out of the store with I didn't make a sale because mm. I just said look these you know for where you're at and what you're doing keep yeah. doing what you're doing at the minute and then come yeah. back and see me if you if, you know yeah, yeah i've got the right gear for you mm. the hashtag for the shop was serious about boxing it was kind of like if you're serious about it, you don't want to get injured yeah. you want to make sure you're doing it correctly come and see me mm. if you're going to mess about it i've actually i've I turned a lot i turned 
sales away when people talk to me about uh, a 20 pound pair of PU gloves and yeah, you're an adult yeah. and I'm just sort of yeah. like mate I can't help you there yeah, absolutely. you know you've got sports directs up the yeah, road you're course. more than welcome to go there if you yeah. want to do it proper and you don't want to get injured because I couldn't live myself selling rubbish mm. and they injure themselves yeah. I don't want that to reflect back on me so mm. the stuff I'm doing it's the stuff that I know is proven it's worked it's yeah. stuff I've worn myself through my career yeah. I know it brings the right protection the reason the glove in here that I wouldn't you know when people say to me what do you recommend Wayne yeah. I'm like anything you see anything you that's see. the beauty yeah, of it the yeah, reason the yeah. budget corner yeah. there isn't that yeah. there are different prices obviously yeah. and we can do you know certain obviously <laughs> rare race we've mm. got gloves a lot cheaper than a yeah, pair of race of course we have yeah, you've got but a whole range. you cannot get a decent you know I'm, I'm looking at like decent stuff really mm. uh, and I think we've got you could actually you could count the amount of brands I've got in store on one hand mm. uh, which many stores I know would never be able to do yeah uh, for me, it's a passion and not a business, and, and and maybe I need to change it around a little bit more. Sometimes it feels like you're going, you know, five step forward and six, but only mm. because of the way I'm moving. Yeah, uh, because yeah. I've always believed that don't do some something to someone else that you wouldn't want them mm. to yourself. Of course, so yeah, yeah. There's never been greed. I'm like, yeah. I don't want you to go out the store and go. You know what? I could have bought that online, twenty quid mm. cheaper. It mm. ain't going to happen here. Mm. It's never going to happen, yeah. and it never does. But it does sort of restrict me slightly because obviously, a lot we don't really do online stuff. Most of the mm. stuff is in store, even yeah. though we've got a website. Mm. Majority of our stuff, ninety percent of what we do is in store. Yeah. So this is where we're looking at getting the income from. Yeah, and you're yeah. still matching the online stuff, so mm. it is hard. And I try and say to some of them, you know, look, give me a break. Don't try and come down even further than mm. that online thing because help me grow, and we can get better brands. Yeah, and yeah. every time we've we've sort of had a bit of a. a We've had a good good run. Yeah. We've ended up coming in. We go right, look. We've got Venom in now. We've got, and I'm trying to get yeah. different v brands in mm. to, to to so I still yeah. do not really make an income out of the shop, but it was never made for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But know. that's that, that's exactly the same with the channel. Everyone thinks when you're on YouTube and you get a few subscribers that you're making loads from YouTube. And it's not the case. I mean, the amount of time you put in, the amount of time I put in. And we're doing it for the people. Well, I, I, can, I, I people. can vouch for that from, yeah. the, from the reviews and 100%. stuff that you've done for me, you know. Yeah. And, uh, 100%. It's, it's not It's getting that. it out there and it's yeah. helping them out. And, yeah. But, you know, I'll get far and I'll never change. Mm. I'll never mm. change. And it's I think that's about... a, a boxing people thing, though. Uh, you know, a lot of boxing people that I've met over the years are just fantastic people. Yeah. Oh, uh, and wanting, folks, yeah. you know, if you're doing coaching with other people, your core is to help other people. That's what you're doing it for. Well, nine, 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 nine years in the amateurs, we've had mm. uh, six national champions through there. We've got a current mm. England's national, you know, it's, it, that, you know, going into the amateur boxing, that was a, a massive thing for me. And I said, yeah. for nine years, I've run all over the country, you know, mm. Uh, mm. and doing that free of charge, it was never, it was yeah. never any money involved. And, and all the people that helped you, all the people that helped you in your career um, to get where you got to. Um, we'll just come to the end of, of sort of the interview now. Um, if you was a pro boxer today, yeah, I think I know the answer. But what gloves would you put on? I'd still be in my Reyes, to be yeah, fair. Yeah, and you'd still have the head guard Reyes. You'd I'd have the four would, kit. You know, like I said to you two two years ago for the charity bout, mm. I wore the head guard, and you can see that on the it's on, on one of the one of the channels we got in there. But literally, I wore the head guard that was to that set for their yeah. gloves. Yeah. I also wore the groin guard in the fight. Yeah. 20 years old. Yeah, You've yeah, shown yeah. me a brand that you could still yeah. be wearing 20 Absolutely. years old and still get the protection out of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Tony Oakley wasn't a small mm. fighter to take on yeah. uh, if the glove if it didn't come to spec. But, you know, uh, yeah, for me, it'd be all day long. Yeah. Uh, I, and I think that the brand, for me, has improved in the quality. I'd like, well, I, I did say originally I would have liked them to do more colours, more variety mm. to the store, but now obviously I can do the custom stuff. Yeah, yeah. That, that's one of the things yeah. that, you know. Let's just talk about the custom stuff. So they yeah. can do, we've got the black and the gold and the white and the gold, but you can get any colour. Any so colour, any, of the, I, any of the raised colours. Yeah, any of the red yeah, colours. So, yeah. so if I wanted, uh, I don't know, a uh, red glove with a silver cuff, yeah, you could get that yeah. ordered and get yeah. that done. If I wanted blue and silver as a nice colour. Well, blue, blue and silver, when you look at blue and silver. Yeah. These are my ones. I had these actually for the uh, for the Oki fight, and these were their first custom ones that they done. Right. And okay. So they've got my name on there and look at them. Look blue at and them. silver, my old club colours. Let's get these up onto the onto the cameras. Yeah, so you can see. So yeah, blue and silver. Um, so if somebody wanted them in that colours, you can order yeah, them. Yeah. And five yeah. six weeks they'll, later, they'll only, they'll only do two colours because remember these guys. These are handmade gloves. Uh, and if you start going over two colours and you start putting more in there, they don't want to mix three because obviously it wrecks uh, the longevity you could get out of them. Yeah. You don't want too many in there. So they'll just mix the two colours. But again, 
you know, uh, they, they look through the charity fight, yeah, mate. They, I look, they I look, look absolutely. My old, my old fight wear colours, and uh, yeah, yeah, that'd be the first one of the first ones they done. Yeah, uh, right. and again, I've got got into that. So yeah, any of the colours that we do, so it's usually about a five or six week turnaround, as you said on, on the video that you done for me. So uh, yeah. But yeah, well, I just think it just makes a difference to us, oh, something that no one else has got. Yeah, absolutely. And, I love and, the brand. And £45 more yeah. than the standard yeah, colours. You can get it. custom colours for £45 more, which I think is absolutely fantastic. I really do. Especially when you think of, say, uh, grants, whereby the standard colours are about 400 oh, yeah, and custom colours can crazy go price, any price, price, anything price. up to... $700 yeah, and all that yeah. price. I've well, loads, yeah. More than that, over a grand. someone coming in and said about $700 for a pair, and I was like, geez, yeah. you know, crazy. 40, £45 pound more for a pair of the... It's the, an absolute steal, and you're is. getting a glove that... <laughs> my gloves are in the stores, as I say, people can see them. Uh, when they come into the store, they can see my old gloves that I wore right the way through my career. Yeah. If you look at the build-up to the IBF, uh, challenge there's loads of stuff on there you'll see me in them raised gloves and all yeah. the, so he's not even like I think he's got mm. Hencho Mexico on him so mm. anyone who knows Cleo Reyes yeah, will know yeah, yeah. that was the old logo from back in the day yeah yeah um, what about boots if you was I always wore today, Adidas I always wore Adidas. Adidas you've got a lot uh, of Adidas boots in yeah we, we do Nikes as well we do the Venoms uh, we've got Ringside I've just got a new one they've just bought out as well uh, in terms of the boots it depends again uh, with the Nikes for me, I've got quite wide feet, mm. so they don't really work for me. Yeah, I've got uh, narrow, I've got quite narrow feet. If you've got so an arch, yeah, an arch. That's Nike what are brilliant. Got. The yeah. Nike boots are beautiful. The kids yeah. are coming here; they're moving around like the money back here. You know, yeah, like, these yeah. are brilliant. Yeah. I tried them on. I was like, ah, mm. I can kind of feel it. It was, it was kind of getting to me. So, but again, it's little things like this that I think that you know, hopefully, it's coming back round and and people are realising the advantages of having a place where you can actually come in. By the way, everything in this store is available to try on. Yeah, yeah. it's not this. It's not a display because mm -hmm. I know there's some place where you go and they're like, no, no, see, mate, you can't try on this yeah, display. Yeah. Anything in this store, I want you to come in. I want you to try it on. I can give you the right advice, and it, you can let me know what you are, what level you're at, uh, what you want to achieve, what you want to come, and I'll let you know. You know, if you're a keep fitter, obviously, I'm going to steer you away from this kind of stuff and put you mm -hmm. on the right track. Again, if you're just starting off, I'm going to put you in the right gear. And that's what it's all about for me, really. And then finding out about their style. Are you a mover? Are you someone that just comes forward? And again, I can I can prove it from there. Again, there's a lot of stuff with the amateurs. They want to buy the the the, the uh, Reyes cheeks and so forth. They want to buy some of the cheek head guards. And I kind of tend to, to get them away from that. So, you know, mm. uh, buy a, an Aiba head guard because yeah. you can't only wear it in your spine, but you can also wear it when you're fighting. And it gets mm. you used to that practice where you can sort of, you wear a big yeah. uh, a face bar or a cheek bar, mm. then you neglect your style. You come out thinking you're doing better than what you actually have, and mm. you get in the ring and it's different. And as I say, rather than wearing the club's one, it's mm. better to have your own. As a coach, oh, you yeah, know yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah, you know yourself. Yeah. As a coach, you get in there with keep How beautiful is it when mm. you just put it on and just do the Velcro? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Not going, oh, let's get this ready because. Tom yeah. had it on last night and we've got to adjust it and whatever. Yeah, so it's little, little tricks like that, really. So I'm saying for the price of an ABA head guard mm. and an EBA head guard compared to the price of a, a cheek or whatever, which are usually far more, mm. you're getting a cheaper deal, but you're actually going to get a lot more benefit out of yeah. it. So it's yeah. little advice like that, really, where I'm not trying, I'm trying to and, steer them in the right and course. You've done, you've done the amateur, you've done the professional, you've been there, you've done it all. So, you know, if you want fantastic advice when you're buying your boxing equipment, then obviously Wayne is here for you in Mad Dogs Boxing in Sutton Coalfield. Um, I, I absolutely love it here. I've been here twice now and I think it's a fantastic shop. And uh, I really wish that the, a shop like this would have been a bit closer to me when I was first started boxing, that's for sure. But thanks ever so much for your time, Wayne. No, I appreciate your time. Absolute pleasure. So uh, thanks very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. Please like and subscribe to Fit to Box channel, and I shall speak to you soon.